We're about to send the colorful metaphors out of some Star Trek, but believe it or not, we at CinemaSins actually love Star Trek. So much so that we made a new CinemaSins podcast called Captain's Pod. A show where the CinemaSins crew can review, sin, and talk about everything Star Trek. So whether you're new to Star Trek, a lifelong Trekkie, or anything in between, join us on the USS Enterprise by searching for Captain's Pod or CinemaSins in your podcast player of choice. Until then, enjoy the video and live, live long, long and prosper. One minute and 41 seconds of Star Trek into darkness with some admittedly great music. But damn, does this movie think it's 2001? Followed by a minute and 20 seconds of nothing but credits that do nothing for nobody. Hey, I never realized the next generation totally stole their theme song from the original Star Trek movie's opening credit score. Also, Robert Wise? You mean West Side Story and Sound of Music Robert Wise? Seems like the kind of guy I'd get to direct my science fiction movie. Here are three Klingon ships that, while capable of cloaking, are approaching this space thing uncloaked, which they definitely won't regret. Tactical is actually standing by on future Afterburner arcade machines. Ah! Typical Klingon behavior. We don't know what this is. Let's shoot it. Jaws Trek. Here's one of the fakest looking spacewalks in film history. And this movie came out almost a decade after 2001. This is unacceptable. I have an exterior visual. Of a fight taking place super far away? How? The Klingons are apparently fighting the ghost of the guitar guy from Mad Max Fury Road. The ball of electric energy headed towards the ship is best represented by a hexagon with six pegs extending off of it. This is when your computer has given up. This glowing ball of explosiveness is way slower than the one that took down the other ship a minute ago. Victory Fart. This movie's planet Vulcan would seem to be super close to another large planet with a weird moon that would seem to deviate from the laws of... Oh, what the f*** do I care? So when Vulcans have sex, do they do it logically? How do you get a boner that way? A symbol of total logic is illogical, like throwing a virgin sacrifice into a sex orgy to appease the gods. I feel like they should have just given him a copy of the game Mist and said, you know what to do, and that would end the ceremony. So these assholes were about to tell Spock he achieved total logicness and give him the symbol of unemotional reasoning. But because the Klingon murdering space gas passed by, they found out he still has emotions and take it back. I feel like these dicks should be stripped of their power for not noticing this sooner. It's amazing how these people live in a world full of matte paintings and don't suffer some sort of depression over it. Their world was lost, but thank God someone painted it back in. The only starship in interception range is the Enterprise. Because Starfleet literally keeps only one ship at Earth, its home base, and most important planet. Even in 1979, Hollywood could not resist the nostalgia glamour shot of something that's not even as cool as the Millennium Falcon. And man, do they ever give you time to stroke it during this scene. No, go ahead, this movie is totally giving you time for that sh**. I mean, the next shot is probably inside this ship's wide open exhaust ports, for those who like close-ups. So wait, when they parked the Enterprise here, did everyone on board have to fly little ships to the Starbase after that? Why is this thing parked all the way out here? Four minute sex brochure for the Enterprise ends with literal penetration at the end of it. Something tells me that none of this ship isn't ready stuff is going to be important until the plot demands it is. Assemble the crew on the recreation deck at 0400 hours. On the recreation deck? Is this ship not big enough for an education deck? Or a we're up against big odds deck? Do the scary deadly mission details have to be relayed on the damn recreation deck? That place is for fun! Admiral Kirk! Well, this is awkward. I'm replacing you as captain of the Enterprise. Starfleet made a decision to give Kirk command of the Enterprise without consulting its current captain in the matter. They felt it better to simply have Kirk drop that bomb on Decker in person. Hell, they had a good four minutes of Enterprise masturbation to tell him before Kirk showed up. My experience. Five years out there dealing with unknowns like this. Wait, five years? That's all? I know the series was cancelled early, but that's all the experience it takes to make Admiral? How desperate is Starfleet anyway? Watch out, coming through. This ship just can't survive without its glass Lego box thingamajig. Oh no, they're forming. Why did they even try to send people through this transporter thing anyway? It wasn't even considered fixed, and they just sent people through. That's a lawsuit right there. And weren't they sending small ships to the Enterprise? Also, what a great way to get Spock back onto the ship. Just kill his replacement in some unnecessary transporter malfunction. F*** him. Starfleet, do you have them? What we got back didn't live long. Tragic off-screen transporter deaths are supposed to remind us of the perilous nature of human life, or the sorry state of the Enterprise, or the dangers of, oh, who f***ing cares? Sadness level increased two notches. The movie will just f***ing move on. Former captain is conveniently here to see Kirk get lost, and also to show off his not super impressive cock and balls. Granted, this video of a seemingly Klingon ship being evaporated by the alien probe is alarming and scary, but who shot that video? The ship that was evaporated? Was it live streamed via Twitch when it went missing or something? If so, how is there any video of the ship free space, eh? Wouldn't a tail mounted camera disappear with the ship? That's all we know about it, except that it is now 53.4 hours away from Earth. 
The alien probe is closer to Earth than the viewer is to the end of this movie. Enterprise is the only Federation starship that stands in its way. That's another thing. This whole movie is predicated on the Enterprise being the closest ship to the cloud. But couldn't they call any number of ships back, use warp speed, and get here in time, and not use a ship badly in need of repair? Our orders are to intercept, investigate, and take whatever action is necessary. Why can't our orders be delivered via shipwide audio broadcast as normal, as opposed to this everyone gathering the recreation hall in-person announcement? Oh, I see. It's so they can all watch firsthand while the energy cloud destroys another vessel. We are under attack! External view. But where is camera? My oath of celibacy is on record, Captain. Did this chick out of the blue just tell Kirk she's not gonna have sex with him? That's presumptuous. But I guess Kirk's oath of promiscuity is on record too, so maybe she's covering her bases. Starfleet reports our last six crew members are ready to beam up, but uh, one of them is refusing to step into the transporter. I can't imagine why. I mean, just five seconds ago it turned two guys into Play-Doh. Guess those bugs got fixed. They transported a few monkeys and now everything's A-OK. -okay. Oh my god, it's horrible. The transporter is still mangling bodies left and right and... Oh, that's just bones, isn't it? Starfleet spacewalk asshole has time to do flips waving goodbye to Enterprise, even though a deadly energy cloud is making its way towards Earth. Party on, Garth! After the four-minute wankathon involving the Enterprise earlier, movie continues to jack off a chafed population. Over 36 and a half minutes of this movie go by before the Enterprise even leaves space dock. In the Star Trek world, all our solar system's planets are super close to each other to create dynamic visuals. Over a minute of wormhole technobabble gibberish. Wormhole distortion has overloaded the main power systems. But cameras showing us the wormhole and the asteroid outside are amazing in clarity for some reason. Mr. Chekhov, stand by on phasers. No! Delay that phaser order! Amazingly, Chekhov obeys, even though Decker breaks the chain of command and Kirk, who is the captain, does not object. Oh, if you're wondering why a two and a quarter hour movie is so long, look no further than the extended everything everyone sees is super slowed down wormhole scene. Why does blowing up the asteroid take them out of the wormhole? Or is that a coincidence? By the way, it's simple as shit. Like Riker and Troy, whom these two clearly inspire, the former captain and the new helmswoman can't help but be drawn to each other due to their complicated romantic past. Non-belligerency confirmed. <laughs> How do futuristic scanners account for the ship's belligerency levels? So Enterprise went into warp, hit a wormhole, ended up god knows where, then proceeded toward the target on impulse power. And Spock and his tiny freighter ship were able to watch all that and put themselves directly in Enterprise's path? Do I have that right? Ah, the 70s, when you could only focus on the close-up guy and the guy in the background by blurring out half the screen. Thanks to Mr. Spock's timely arrival, and assistance, we have the engines rebalanced into full warp capacity. I'm calling it Spock X Machina. Thank God he failed miserably at logic. Warp point eight. Warp six. More than 30 seconds of speeding up. This new plot development required Kirk to put on a new shirt. Is Uhura holding on to her workstation during this warp speed increase? Because looking at everyone else, that is completely unnecessary. And I'm figuring wouldn't help much either. I believe it may hold my answers. Well, isn't it lucky for you that we just happen to be heading your way? Bones would be amazing at CinemaSins. Energy of a type never before encountered. Then how can you even read the existence of said energy? You have scanners that can read energy regardless of type? The new screen's held. These screens are so powerful that I don't want to see the ship have trouble with an enemy torpedo ever again. I mean, damn. Our previous transmission mode was too primitive to be received. I am now programming our computer to transmit lingua code at their frequency and rate of speed. How does raising the frequency and rate of speed make the primitive lingua code turn into advanced lingua code? And how do you increase that shit with the current technology on board? We can't withstand another attack. That thing is... 20 hours away from Earth. You know, I'm a casual Star Trek fan, and I always thought when people made fun of William Shatner's line readings, they were exaggerating. But, um, no, they got it right. So here's a four-minute section completely devoted to flying through blue and green Apple II graphics, and a collection of reaction shots that are supposed to instill some sense of wonder into the viewer, but really makes them wonder if The Empire Strikes Back can come soon enough. People often ask what makes this movie bad, and I often point to sequences like this that do nothing but prolong the movie without adding anything. Northern Lights Ribcage! Wait, what? Closing on it rapidly, Captain. Well, you could have fooled me. Seriously, what the f***? This is a nearly one minute long unbroken take as they approach this ship in the middle of the cloud. I'm adding 20 sins for this movie's inability to cut the length of its awe and wonder shots. I'm pretty sure I've seen these exact Sulu reaction shots in the previous 10 minutes of nothing this movie calls a film. Ditto for the hot bald chick. And at one point during this excruciatingly long sequence, Bones walked in for a moment, then walked back out. Probably because the filmmakers didn't want to worry Trek fans that he'd die in the length of time it took to navigate this alien cloud. The script here literally says, nothing happens for 10 pages, and is followed by 10 blank pages. Glowing spiky egg sac balls of meaninglessness. Hooray for science fiction! Don't interfere with it! Unnecessary orders. When something finally does happen in this movie, it looks like this. Not one person in the crew shrieks in terror after that sh 
Hey, look, Bones came back. Yay for Bones. Oops, there he goes again. Bye, Bones. Hopefully they give you a line next time. What the f*** is this screen showing? Blue spiky things? It's more worthless than the shapeless honeycomb bullshit screens to the right. The aperture is closing. Reverse angle on the viewer, Captain. The alien ship closes its sphincter, signaling a lack of interest in interstellar anal sex. Tractor beam has released us, Captain. You are now free to move about the interior of the alien ship. Maneuvering thrusters, Mr. Sulu. Ahead one third. They are still flying towards this thing. I'm not just being a snarky asshole when I say this whole thing could have been cut in half. You are the cook unit. You will assist me. Girl who seemed like a computer the entire movie comes back possessed by the alien and still seems like a computer. Look, just as a practical matter, she left the ship in a Starfleet uniform and she returned into a sonic shower in a white mini dress straight out of my preteen fantasies. One thing's for sure, this alien is a teenage boy. Jim, what's going on? Tricorder. I'm the ship doctor, but I don't actually carry a tricorder. Carbon-based units. Humans, Ensign Perez. Jesus, who did this guy f to get on this ship? A thorough examination of this probe might provide some insight. Admit it, you just want to see the sexy android naked. I'm programmed to observe and record. Why does an alien race so advanced to be able to incapacitate and capture the Enterprise still need to send a humanoid observer probe thing onto the ship to determine the fate of its new captive? Goddamn, this movie is in love with that double focus shot with blur all around the edges. Must have been new technology at the time or something. This is at least the 47th use of it in this movie. I have recorded enough here. I just needed five minutes of bullshit data to complete my job. I'm really glad this unfeeling alien entity, whatever it is, decided to keep Ilya's high heels on during the information gathering process for utmost sexiness. All those vessels were called Enterprise. Didn't the probe say she was done recording? The f*** is she doing now? This is one of the games. Floor bass guitar hero. Within you are the memory patterns of a certain carbon unit. If I can help you to revive those patterns, you could understand our functions better. That is logical. You may proceed. What? That is totally not logical. Your computer brain would not allow the possibility that anything Ilya is still alive at all. In fact, you said that unit no longer functions just a minute ago. I'm passing through a connecting tunnel. Apparently a kind of plasma energy conduit. Who is he f***ing talking to? Also, none of this dangerous looking electricity frightens me in the least as I fly my thruster suit through it. I must try to mind meld with it. Can you mind meld through spacesuit gloves though? Well, I guess you can mind meld with that alien thing through a spacesuit. Who knew? Who allowed Kirk to come out here? There are at least three Starfleet regulations about the safety of captains being ignored right now. And we're being robbed of the scene where someone tried to stop him and Kirk told him off in triumphant fashion. Good thing the unfeeling living machine decided to somehow spit out the unconscious Spock to safety. The creator has not answered. The carbon unit infestation is to be removed from the creator's planet. V'ger never once considers that the carbon units are its creator, which they ultimately are, and which V'ger ultimately accepts for no reason. V'ger is stupid. The vessel, V'ger, obviously operates from a central brain complex. Obviously. When do those devices reach final position? 27 minutes. Mark! They're already in Earth's atmosphere. It's gonna take a goddamn half an hour for them to get in position? The f***? Instead of transporting anywhere closer to the target, these assholes go elevator than spacewalk for maximum film runtime. Why did none of you wear a f***ing spacesuit? God damn, is there air? You don't know. They've gone way too far in this movie to ever be in a place where they don't show the entire walk to V'ger's brain. V-G-E-R. V'ger. V'ger understands the drama of the situation and lets out an inception grunt of approval. Wait a f***ing second. Why does V'ger think it's V'ger based on one little smudgy nameplate? With all its vast knowledge, wouldn't it know that it's Voyager? What part of V'ger's brain casually looked at a physical nameplate and said, Yep, that's my name, all right. Time to rule the universe. They built this entire vessel so that Voyager could actually fulfill its programming. And on its journey back, it amassed so much knowledge, it achieved consciousness itself. Yeah, but what kind of knowledge was it gathering to become conscious? It's in space. It's not like it's connected to the internet or something. It might be able to tell you the chemical composition of Jupiter, but it never got rejected for the prom, or whatever the triggering event is that makes us ponder the big questions in life. Feature speaks, but it's less intelligible than my neighbor's dogs. That's what it's been signaling. It's readiness to transmit its information. And there's no one on Earth who could recognize the old signal and send a response. Earlier in the movie, this thing was communicating on a frequency that was so fast the Enterprise could not talk to it because the ship's signal was too primitive. Now they're saying V'ger's trying to use a 300-year-old signal after it was modified into much better technology? Just five minutes from the end, this movie's still threatening to put me to sleep. The creator must join with V'ger. I'm in love with a fake-ass alien clone of my former girlfriend face. You mean this machine wants to physically join with a human? Amazingly, yes. That's exactly what this machine wants to do. Even though just four minutes ago, its probe said this. That is not logical. 
carbon units are not true life forms. Yet somehow the machine circled back on this through all the exposition we just heard, and it will now accept a carbon life form as the creator. Captain Vaughn, future pedophile McDaddy, disappears in a hail of alien lights, and I'm honestly just ready to go to bed, y'all. And Beecher was never seen again. It attained the answers to its questions and moved to a farm in Idaho and had three android kids. Two minutes of opening credits that do nothing for nobody. Ricardo Montalban? How could I possibly sit through this movie and not make, like, a thousand and one Fantasy Island jokes? And yeah, I know he was in that one episode of Star Trek that one time. Reading. Also, what about in the 23rd century? What about it, huh? What about it? Starship Enterprise on training mission to Gamma Hydra. Movie drops Enterprise name into the Kobayashi Maru test, pretty much only to try and trick the viewing audience into thinking this opening sequence is real and not the Kobayashi Maru. Jeez, Spock, Uhura, Bones, and Sulu? Could the movie be trying any harder to make me think this isn't a Starfleet Academy test? Also, are we really to believe these three super senior officers are spending their time play-acting as junior bridge officers for the sake of college students? Stand by. Nice dramatic turn entrance, but what the f*** were you doing just now facing the science officer's ass? In other words, dramatic turn for the sake of dramatic turn is dramatic turn. Klingons on attack course and closing. Don't worry, it's those exact same Klingons in the exact same formation from the exact same shot in the first Star Trek movie. V'ger will take care of <laughs> This is a simulation, right? Why would you put something that dangerous in a simulation? Or is Sulu really that great of an actor? And now we find out it's a simulation. None of what we saw mattered. Still, this fake action is better than the first movie, which I think is still going on. What about my performance? Your performance? It's Sulu's that was the best in this scenario. And looks like he pulled off another amazing feat by disappearing from this scene altogether. Admiral. Wouldn't it be- Ah, George Takai! Hmm, Kirk collects old revolvers and old ships. What marvelous character development by set design. Also, that telescope is clearly pointed at the apartment of some promiscuous green-skinned alien floozy. Is there any doubt? Oh, now we get the curved fireplace wall of helmets? Who am I hiding from? From yourself, Admiral. Hiding from your shelf, cliché. We are continuing our search for a lifeless planet to satisfy the requirement of a test site for the Genesis experiment. So far, no success. The universe of this movie suggests it's really hard to find planets with no life. Futuristic communication displays will have terrible horizontal hole. Did they get this guy off a scrap heap from the Blue Lagoon auditions? I can barely see it. Because this is a movie, we've beamed you down roughly several thousand yards from a maybe possible life form thing. Space breaking and entering. Yeah, we're definitely positive this place has oxygen, so let's remove our helmets instantly. Science! This asshole has two copies of Paradise Lost, and one copy of the Holy Bible. We've been standing here in a sandstorm waiting for you to come outside just for this dramatic moment. Starship reliant to Captain Terrell. Wait, that dude was the captain? And he went on a wee team mission with one other dude? How many Starfleet regulations did that sh break? Movie unintentionally inspires Kylo Ren. Khan. Okay, fine. Maybe they briefed you on the existence of this guy Khan. But you weren't in the episode Space Seed, of which this movie is a continuation. You weren't even in that season. And then this asshole Khan pretends like he knows you. I'm not buying it, Chekhov! Captain Kirk was your host. He repaid his hospitality by trying to steal his ship and murder him. Thanks, expositional Chekhov. Oh no, that worm is about to go inside that ear-shaped Play-Doh. I see the crew is still taking smaller ships and shuttles to the Enterprise, and they're still parking her in Section ZZ at Disneyland. In the last movie, the transporter was on the Fritz, and it made some sense they had to take some shuttles here. But now that all is normal, can't they just beam to this thing? Second Star Trek movie felt like the first Star Trek movie didn't slobber over the Enterprise enough, so adds more slobbering. I had a wee bout, sir, but uh, Dr. McCoy pulled me through. Wee bout of one. Surely that oh. was. Is this movie saying Scotty has gonorrhea? First training voyage, Mr. Preston. Yes, sir. Well, see to it that you don't die tragically. Have you ever piloted a starship out of space, Doc? Never, sir. Well, it's easy. You just tell Sulu to pilot it out. Take her out, Mr. Savick. In the future, we will be calling women Misters, despite Star Trek being one of the most socially inclusive properties of all time. I mean, why not just refer to her rank and <laughs> no? You might be tempted to think this guy down here is waving goodbye to the fleet's flagship, but really he's just trying to get their attention to tell them they left a coffee cup on top of the ship before taking off. His efforts were in vain, and a six-dollar coffee was lost forever. Lieutenant, are you wearing your hair differently? It's still regulation, Admiral. It is? What the f*** isn't regulation, then? May I speak, sir? This logic-driven, nervous rookie Vulcan stops the turbo lift before even asking if she can speak freely. Based on this shot alone, how am I to know if I'm on the fourth or fifth floor? I feel like I'm on the 4.5 floor, just based on the signs. This futuristic science station is composed of 40% light brights. Is it cool that this mirror is a mirror that also has airport landing strip lights inside it? Yes. Yes, it is. Is it in any way practical? Well, I can't see how it possibly could be practical, so no. We're the only ship in the quadrant. As always, the Enterprise is the only ship in the quadrant. They should have named the Enterprise the Serendipity. Spock, these... Cadets of yours, how good are they? How will they respond under real pressure? Well, they're cadets, so... So much for the little training cruise. Was that what this was? What the f*** was the newly minted Admiral Kirk doing on a little training cruise? Thank God he's a micromanager, huh? 
He tasks me, and I shall have him. Now I can see why that copy of Moby Dick was haphazardly tossed on the top of all that divine comedy we saw earlier, so that Khan could completely ignore the message of that book. Well, I've got sick bay ready. Now, will someone please tell me what's going on? If you don't know what's going on, then what do you have sick bay ready for exactly? Identify for retina scan. Kirk, Admiral James T. Processing your obviously completely different expression from the previous shot, Admiral. How much money did they spend on this high production value video about a super secret thing no one's supposed to know about? How many graphic effects artists had to sign NDAs just to get this thing made? Matter is reorganized with life-generating results. And despite this lifeless moon or planet's distance from a sun, it will be able to maintain that life for some reason. It's one of ours, Admiral. It's Reliant. Okay, so Kirk doesn't know that Khan and crew are free and in control of Reliant, sure. But a quick microsecond computer search would reveal Reliant is the Federation ship assigned a regular one. The space station Kirk got a personal emergency message from. So, you know, one sin for no individual or computer on this ship running a basic Google search for the Reliant at this point in the movie. They're still running with shields down. Which is amazing, because you'd think that something like hijacked ships were just common enough that the Enterprise would be cautious in a situation like this. For a ship that doesn't have its shields up, the Enterprise takes these phasers like a champ. You'd think the series of explosions in this sector would lead to devastation, but you'd be wrong. They knew exactly where to hit us. Oh. Except where the weapons are. But what are the chances the Enterprise gets a chance to shoot those up? Khan. Have we pointed out how amazingly crazy-ass Lucky Khan is yet? Chekhov just happens to land on his exile planet thinking it was a completely different planet, on a mission involving Project Genesis, something that can both create and destroy all life on a planet, an invention perfect for megalomaniacs. He wants revenge on Kirk, who also just happens to be tagging along on a training mission when everything goes down, and he comes to the scene gift wrapped for a revenge plot. I've deprived your ship of power, and when I swing around, I mean to deprive you of your life. But I wanted you to know first who it was who had beaten you. Okay, fair enough. He wants to rub it in. But why did he shoot that photon torpedo at the bridge a minute ago if that was his plan? That easily could have killed Kirk. You hand over to me all data and material regarding the project called Genesis. Why does he need that from Kirk? Doesn't the Reliant have the same information the Enterprise does? Shortly before he left, he tried to get as much info from Chekhov and Terrell that he could, right? This is some bullshit just so Kirk can buy the time necessary to escape. Admiral, it's coming through now, Khan. Khan is kind of a stupid f***ing idiot to fall for this stalling tactic counterattack, no? Soon, lock phasers on target and await my command. Phasers locked. Awesome, but a minute ago when Reliant locked phasers on you prior to firing, you could tell. Lock phasers on target. Locking phasers on target. They're locking phasers. So what gives, yo? Meantime, let's find out how badly we've been hurt. Screenwriter timing allows for this tragic real-life answer to Kirk's rhetorical question. Also, can you think of any reason the chief engineer would leave the engine room, carrying a dead body, and show up on the bridge like this? Kirk tours the overflowing emergency room of his own making, which, good for him, facing his demons, tending to his flock, but... It's kind of downright unbelievable not one of these injured or maimed patients calls Kirk out for wantonly ignoring the call to raise shields at a time that would have avoided all this carnage. Not one boo or anything. Is the word given, Admiral? The word is given. Um, what? What word? What does this exchange mean? You're allowed to die, kid? Who is at your post, Scotty? While you cry over one dead trainee of many, who's fixing the goddamn ship and doing their duty right now, huh? Eh? What? Engine room reports auxiliary power restored. We can proceed at impulse power. And the trainees down there in the engine room did it all without the help of seasoned veteran Scotty, who was in f***ing sick bay crying over a dead kit. Also, didn't they lose their main power before? And they just now restored auxiliary power? How did they do all that shit they did to the Reliant with the existing power they had? Hey, we're beaming to a science station that might be held by enemy forces. Let's go with the winter uniform, shall we? Somehow, despite all logic and Starfleet regulations, this away team includes the captain, the chief doctor, and a brand new recruit with no experience, making it the least logical away team in the history of Star Trek. <laughs> Is this an even more ridiculous rat than the one that shows up in a vent at CIA headquarters in Mission Impossible? Or did Scorsese possibly direct this <laughs> Character accidentally bumps into dead appendages cliche. Now I know where Jurassic Park got it. This movie mistook blood for super bright red paint. He put creatures in our bodies to control our minds. And he's hoping you'll forget how stupid it would be for him to take them out before you got here, so that he can trick you again. Did he make it down here? It was not my impression. He spent most of his time trying to wring the information out of the people. Khan apparently tried to extract information from everybody on this base, but somehow didn't scour the area looking for a place like this, which would have told him everything. The unit's been left on, which means nobody remained to turn it off. Because, as we all know, Star Trek transporter rooms are turned to the off switch after every successful transportation. Admiral, if we go by the book, like Lieutenant Samick... Look, Khan is a super genius, okay? The fact that he doesn't realize he's being tricked right here is insane! Hey, Lieutenant Savick, don't bother scanning for life forms down here or anything. That's not important at all. By the book, indeed. I'm sorry, Admiral. Mind control slugs apparently leave enough of the original brain behind to allow for apologies like this, I guess. Knew it, you son of a bitch! 
Well, as long as the character is unimportant, I'm okay with this accidental evaporation. Kill. And the absolutely, totally mind-controlled guys suddenly have a hard time following orders. Starfleet captain who was mind-controlled to this point somehow overcomes his mind-control, which sounds awesome until I tell you he only overcame it long enough to commit suicide. And why does the other mind-control worm want to escape all of a sudden? Did it feel its twin get murdered and now it needs to mourn? Dude, at least let it crawl away from Chekhov for a few seconds before obliterating it. Jesus. Buried alive. Buried alive. Come! Also, dude, you're tricking him about the time the Enterprise needs to heal, remember? Why are you so upset at this apparent radio win by Khan? Is this method acting? Who is Khan? Hi there, person who obviously didn't watch the TV show or the first hour of this movie. Let me exposition you to death. How can you think of food at a time like this? First How could you not think of food right now, dude? Humans be hungry, yo. If you're not hungry, you might be an alien controlled by the ear slugs. Why didn't you tell him? How can you ask me that? Is this really some baby mama drama in a Star Trek movie? Skip. Genesis is not conflicted with the production designer about whether there's such a thing as too many waterfalls. Character Spock, it's two hours. Are you ready? Right on schedule, Admiral. Wait, you spoke in code earlier because they could intercept your transmissions, but now you're, what, speaking in anti-code? Awesome Kirk is smart moment absolutely ruined by the inconsistent logic. We were immobilized. Captain Spock said it would be two days. Got got Movie suggests you can carry out conversations during transportation. They're inoperative, low sea deck. What is we're here on? Not much, Admiral. We have partial main power. Ah, partial main power. That explains nothing. Sauce for the goose, Mr. Savick. The odds will be even. What? Walk with purpose now? With purpose. Do these grates all need to be lifted up before a torpedo can fire? Because if so, that's f***ing stupid. And why is the torpedo loading bay super huge and open to human beings? Shouldn't this be a contained unit on either side of the- Oh, f This is the dumbest torpedo protocol ever. Also, if torpedoes take this long to load and launch, the Federation is f***ing doomed, man. Jesus Christ, do they do all this bullshit every time they launch a torpedo? Because haven't I seen Kirk order someone to fire their torpedoes, plural, before? Imagine all these below-deck performers having to do all this shit double time. Reliant is closing. I will give you the time before we hit the nebula, but I will not give you any kind of time data on the ship trailing us that wants to kill us. That I shall leave vague. They just don't want us going in there. David pops onto the bridge seconds after the ship-rattling warning shot from Reliant, during which we were treated to a shot of David not anywhere near the bridge, down below with the doctor and his mother and shit. I'm laughing at the superior intellect. Khan falls for this. Raise the shield. As I feared, sir. Not functional. Why is the nebula selective about what can and can't work inside of it? I get the monitoring systems going out, even the shields, but why not a whole bunch of other systems, like the ability to fly the ship? Enterprise lucks out and ends up directly behind the Reliance somehow. I mean, Jesus, there are no shields up. This ship has been hit a million times at this point. It's on auxiliary power. What the f*** does it take to kill it? I've got to take the mains off the line. I have no idea what any of this means. The power this ship uses and runs out of is completely random whatever nonsense to make the movie more dramatic. And this particular plot development will lead to Spock making a dramatic sacrifice well, until he appears in the next movie. He's intelligent, but not experienced. His pattern indicates two-dimensional thinking. He's not intelligent, Spock. He's a f***ing genetically engineered superhuman whose inexperience with starship battles should not prevent him from thinking three-dimensionally. Funny how these two ships lost in a gas cloud continue to find each other at the last minute on the static-filled monitor. These guys are playing battleship, but with flashes of the opponent's board before they take a shot. How is everybody dead on the bridge except Khan? Yeah, he's got superior physical ability, but not against, oh, explosions, right? I can't stop giggling at this engineering dude back here, who, from the looks of it, just has a bad headache. But hell if he's gonna intervene in this situation, or even notice it. Engine room! What's happening? Man, he waited a long time before calling down there a second time. Spock was still on the bridge the last time he called engineering. Why aren't there radiation suits for exactly this kind of occurrence? I think you better get down here. You need to take a look at this cliche. Spock! This is a room you get killed for going in. You go in here like when you're a technician at a starbase and the ship is in for an overhaul and the radioactive engine has been shut down for a while. But sure, let's put an intercom in there, just in case we ever need that. Ship, out of danger. Gotta admit, Spock's sacrifice is one of the most badass moments of badassery ever badassed, and we will remove five cents for it. We are assembled here today to pay final respects to our honored dead. He's dead now, but only if this movie is an absolute total failure. You know what brings people back from the dead? Straight cash, homie. This was the most human. Goddamn, this scene gets me every time. Two sins off for real emotions in a Star Trek movie. Why are they torpedoing Spock out onto the Genesis planet? I mean, thank God they do, but that's not the point. Do Vulcans not have burial rituals or cemeteries? Um. And that's exactly what walks through the door. Very proud to be your son. Then James T. Kirk and his son had many, many adventures after this movie. He's really not dead, as long as we remember him. 
and we write screenplays with Spock in them. We really, really, really don't want you to actually think we killed Spock. Don't grieve him, Admiral. Previously on Star Trek. I have been, and always shall be. This is a great scene in Star Trek 2, but Spock did not do the live long and prosper sign until actually saying live long and prosper. Also, the first two minutes of this movie are literally footage from the previous movie. Jesus. Space. The final frontier. Whisper narration. More than two minutes of cloud and space credits that do nothing for nobody. If the movie is directed by Spock, then that takes all the fun out of trying to find Spock. The death of Spock is like an open wound. It was a dark and stormy night. The timing is excellent, Mr. Scott. You fix the barn door after the horses come home. Well, that's a dickheaded thing to say, especially over the all-ship radio. You think Scotty doesn't know this already, ass? Eight weeks, sir. But you don't have eight weeks, so I'll do it for you in two. Well, that was easy. Hey, everybody, it's Christopher Lloyd. You know, from Taxi. The Klingons keep RUSs as pets, proving once and for all that The Princess Bride and Star Trek take place in a shared universe. This is basically a space 8-track, which only makes sense if the movie is made in an era where 8-tracks are still a thing, which it was, so still sending the 8-trackness of it all. This whole ship appears to explode, but the people here get to chill like nothing's happened for a split second before the explosion reaches them. Um, in HD, you can totally see the slightly lighter background box behind the Enterprise as it passes over this planet. Never noticed that until I intentionally nitpicked this movie for YouTube, which suggests it's still probably pretty good effects for its time. Still sending it because I have a sin counter to pad, you know? Space porn that could double as a sex ed video. Hey, it's Excelsior, Sulu's future ship from Undiscovered Country. Neat! My friends, the great experiment. Um, that experiment works, and it saves your ass three movies from now. But scoff all you want, old-timer. Aye. And if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a wagon. But wouldn't she, though? Yeah, better go check that alone. You're only the captain of this ship. Those two officers didn't sign up for this. Enterprise is 20 years old. Jesus, they let that thing fly around for 20 years? And the crew is complaining about retiring it? I mean, I'm on the side of Starfleet here. In your absence, Genesis has become a galactic controversy. You are all under orders not to discuss with anyone your knowledge of Genesis. This is something we could have told you long before you got back, but it feels better doing it now, after you could have violated the policy already. Theoretical data on the Genesis device. I get that the chick in that earlier scene stole and gave them this. My question is, when did Kirk find the time to record himself speaking authoritatively on Genesis since the last movie? The only answer is the flight home to Earth. But then I counter with, why isn't Dr. Marcus making this video? Who's this video even made for? Why make a video of information you are going to personally deliver in hours when you get back to Earth? Wouldn't they already have the Carol Marcus explainer video about it from the Rathacon? I guess my point is, this is one of the most expositional use only videos to ever appear in a movie. Instead of a dead moon, a living, breathing planet now exists. With no warmth or energy from a nearby sun, we also generate ten Dumbledores in order to sustain life on the planet. This is where the fun begins, Savick. That is not Savick. Couldn't you have at least picked an actress that even kind of resembles Kirstie Alley? Sector 2, indicating desert terrain. Minimal vegetation. But why? The Genesis Project creates life out of nothing. How would that include a desert with minimal vegetation? Cross-referenced and verified. An unidentifiable life form reading. <laughs> do you even hear yourself speaking that incongruous sentence? Verified, unidentifiable readings? Why do we beam it up? Yeah, sure, an unidentifiable life form. Why not? Luckily, the captain is hilariously and obviously by the book, so this idea is not entertained. Ahura has a ravioli ring. Well... Phew, that search for Spock didn't take long, and, well, sh Spock trusted you, and you denied him his future. Spock's dad, the audience, everyone in the universe except for Kirk seems to realize the Genesis planet would revive Spock. Mind melding just got a whole lot sexier. Oh, yeah. Sarek is getting more free homemade porn right now with green aliens than I ever will. Even after seeing Bones literally say things Spock would say, after breaking into Spock's quarters, then hearing this shit about Vulcans mind melding with someone before they die, Kirk still doesn't make the connection that Spock's essence is inside Bones. Yes, he wonders aloud if Spock joined with someone else and goes to check the video, but he should fing know it's Bones instantly, no? Man, it's insane how many angles the Enterprise was recording this shit from, right? It's almost cinematic. Repeat. And augment. Augment? That's the Starfleet jargon version of the zoom and enhance cliche. Exercise caution, Lieutenant. When this guy retires, he'll be decorated as the most careful captain Starfleet ever produced. There are your life forms. These were microbes on the tube surface. Microbes, by their very definition, are microscopic living organisms. I hate to be nitpicky, but these seem way more visible without a microscope than usual. Also, mmm, unexplained alien space ravioli. And the search for Spock has ended. Ah, shit, and microbes got our hopes up. Jen, your life and your career stand for rationality, not for intellectual chaos. Oh, f 
This asshole just described the opposite of what Jim Kirk's career has stood for. No one will be seated during the Spock-McCoy hybrid goes to the bar scene. This video game is clearly stupid. There, I said it. How soon is now? Star Trek character inspires the most popular song the Smiths ever produced. McCoy is basically Spock at this point, but only the secrets of the Vulcan nerve pinch didn't transfer for some reason. I guess the reason is comic relief, but still. No one pulls a punch better than William goddamn Shatner. Yes, let's put away that amazing, super useful destructoid gizmo and never use it again in the future history of our adventures. Word of Kirk and Sulu breaking bones out of prison should be all over Starfleet at this point, and the Enterprise the number one search location. But these simple facts will not get in the way of the plot. Also, a movie will make it seem like hijacking and piloting a Starfleet vessel with a handful of people is easy, even though Star Trek Into Darkness would have us believe it takes a superhuman brain to create a super ship that is top secret and oh my god, what have I become? The ship should need more people to operate, is all I meant to say. A chimpanzee and two trainees could run. Okay, first of all, that's racist against chips and Starfleet trainees. Second of all, why does any starship go out with a crew of hundreds if they're this easy to run with six people? Third of all, is that velvet? This captain is clearly not captain material. This mother files his nails. Excelsior powering up with orders to pursue. Because we, the rogue stolen ship, can still see Starfleet ship status and active orders, naturally. I have no clue what Scotty did to override Starfleet's lockdown on the space doors. All we saw was Scotty and Kirk looking hopefully at them. I'm simply gonna assume the reason they opened is bullshit and move on. Also, if they have that kind of control over the space doors, they should be able to close it behind them and make sure that faster, better ship doesn't follow them, even if Scotty sabotaged the other ship. Thank God for the plot of this movie that these were the only two starships anywhere in this area, as usual. Here, Doctor. Souvenirs from one surgeon to another. All that stuff I stole from the other ship's trans warp drive? I have them right here for you to look at because that's fun. Best speed to Genesis. Even though that prison break was a kind of fun scene, it's taken nearly 50 minutes for the Enterprise to finally Star Trek 3. This unclothed child should probably be a dead Spocksicle. Captain Spock. Okay, I need you to go through this whole range of emotions here, and perfect. All the same, I'm going to advise Starfleet and get instructions. I need to pad my most cautious captain statistics in time for the Whispering Rose Awards Banquet. Captain Buford won last year, and by God, he will not get a second. The moral of this story is stop being so goddamn careful all the time. You might get blown up by a surprise Klingon ship run by Doc Brown. Protomatter. An unstable substance which every ethical scientist in the galaxy has denounced as dangerously unpredictable. Yeah, but if we're talking about the creation of life on desolate planets anyway, where's the ethics line drawn? We're gonna have to shame Kirk's kid for breaking the rules on a project like this. Send Captain Esteban my compliments. But make sure to do it in a careful manner. You'll like that. This goes on for some time. Now that we've cloaked, here's a shot of Krug's dog for no reason. And what do I find? A weakling human? A Vulcan boy? And a woman. That's racist three times. Federation starship approaching. Bring me up. How come a bird of prey Klingon ship can't fire while cloaked? At least until undiscovered country. But it can beam people in and out while cloaked? It's always bugged me. There. That distortion. See it? And Kirk just made cloaking technology obsolete. Or else it was never very good to begin with. Or else no one prior to Kirk bothered to use their eyes instead of the sensors. No shields. My guess is right. They'll have to decloak before they can fire. Yeah, but why can't you raise your shields and fire? Have I not seen countless Star Treks where they had their shields up and were still able to shoot enemy ships? I mean, the f And despite giving their full power to the weapon systems, two torpedoes don't destroy the Klingon ship at all. Sir, the shield's non-responsive. Your automation system's overloaded. I didn't expect to take us into combat, you know. Oh, come on. You couldn't bring this up until now? Where were your concerns before this happened? And what a bunch of bullshit to create artificial conflict. Also, the shield is non-responsive. But can't you still fire some torpedoes? Or is automation overload code for we can't do shit anymore? Kirk survives this. I don't know why we didn't bring some sort of blaster with us down here, so a knife will have to do, I guess. I can't see how anything could go wrong. Oh no, something went wrong. Well, at least they got the one out of the three that isn't integral to the plot. Bring on passage of kill my son. You knew him for like two hours. Don't get all dramatic about it. Cling on best. Oh yeah, I forgot. That's racist. Destruct sequence two. Code one. 1A. I love how these assholes have working self-destruct codes for a decommissioned ship they f***ing stole from Space Dock. Awaiting final code for one minute countdown. Code. Zero. 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 So basically the final self-destruct password for Enterprise is password then? Can transporter bays really handle this kind of complex multiple asshole beaming? Especially since the ship was just hit and apparently has very little power. This feels like a new level of bullshit even for transporter beams. 
I, for one, am glad that the Enterprise's self-destruct sequence allows for the cinematically pleasing throwing of fools into the air before the whole ship explodes. Enterprise Wreckage just tells me they'll find a way to rebuild this shit for the next movie, which is about whales, by the way. <laughs> Puberty strength. What happened? He gave his life to save us. Space Jesus, son of Kirk! Star Trek 3 really loved Moth. Or really loved washing white Starfleet tops in the same load as red Starfleet pants. One of the two. Man, that is some Lion King level rock movement right there. And Krug didn't even need to sing a song. This planet, created by an artificial godlike substance, is playing the Deus Ex Machina to perfection during this fight. No! Is he falling sideways? Moth! Luckily, Beam Me Up is the only Klingon Kirk knows. Needs to work on the Christopher Lloyd impression, but he probably knew Maltz wouldn't ask questions about that. Oh yeah, Uhura. Too mad you had to sit this one out for some reason. Good job being here on Vulcan at the end for a celebratory hug. Without any explanations or conversations beforehand, they just drag Spock into this funeral ceremony, not briefing Bones on what he might have to do for Spock to keep Spock alive, or any kind of Spock preparation at all. I mean, Spock, that's stupid. No one even explained to Kirk how far he could go into this glorified funeral parlor. I guess no one had any conversations of any kind before going through with this. I ask for Fal Torpan, the refusion. What you seek has not been done since ages past. And then only a legend. Your request is not logical. Oh, but these three women holding up their right hands and wearing bunny ears is logical? Just do the Faltor pan, lady. Can someone tell me why I'm aroused right now? Is it all the cross dissolves and intimate close ups that are fooling me into thinking I'm watching softcore porn? Literally over five minutes of ceremonial Vulcan bullshit we already know the outcome of. So Bones is okay. Spock is walking upright. Does no one on Vulcan stop to think about the fact that they just pulled off the Faltor pan, which was just a legend before tonight? You assholes believe in ceremonies and a bunch of bullshit. So it's hard to believe you and step back and go, God damn, that was remarkable. Why would you do this? Because the needs of the one outweighed the needs of the many. Kirk flipped the script on you, Spock. Damn. Wait a minute. That still doesn't make any sense. I can't help but think this whole thing could have been avoided if they'd just brought Spock back to his home planet in the first fucking place. Sure, he wouldn't have gotten that sweet, sweet regenesis to magically come back to life, but we could have avoided this movie at least. Bring on the whales! Spock getting to direct a Trek film before Kirk really was the final nail in the coffin of their friendship, so I'm told. But Nimoy did a great job with three and then hit it out of the park with four, whereas Shatner directed the only Trek film more boring than the motion picture. <laughs> hmm, something not quite right here. That's better! It appears to be a probe, Captain. How the f*** would you know that? Because it's broadcasting or making noise? Because it's simplistic in design? In just two movies, this fellow becomes the head of Starfleet. What is this graphic even telling us? There are no measurements for length, mass, or speed. All it seems to tell us is what the probe would look like if it was rendered on an Atari 2600. Here's a video that purports to show the insides of the Enterprise right before Kirk blew it up at the end of Search for Spock. And a view of the explosion from outside the ship. But where is camera, Starfleet? Where is camera? This is clearly just movie footage being used to save money, and I am okay with that, but I will sin it. Also, previously on Star Trek. And the result of this awesome energy was euphemistically called the Genesis Planet, a secret base from which to launch the annihilation of the Klingon people! See, kids, people making wild political conspiracy theories about naturally occurring events has been going on for decades. Also, how is the Genesis planet a better strike point against the Klingons than the dead moon it was before? Can Starfleet not use bases and satellites and starships and essentially base on SETI Alpha 5 with or without active climate and vegetation? We no further outbursts from the floor. Good luck enforcing that! They all appear to have alcoholic drinks, man. And don't tell me the entire body of this Senate came in thirsty and just ordered water. Mr. President. I've come to speak on behalf of the accused. Considering how shocked the crowd was by this entrance, it appears Sarek wasn't even in this room, which means he was either late or they started the proceedings early. What kind of hearing starts before the defense is even turned up? The council's deliberations are over. The f***? You finish without hearing the side of the accused? There shall be no peace as long as Kirk lives. But that does lead to the undiscovered country, so f*** you, dude. Captain's log, star date 8390. Star dates, man. How do they work? Obviously painted Klingon bird of prey is obviously painted. Wizard of Oz did a better job with the painted backgrounds. I know it's fairly unbelievable, but thank Murdoch that Chekhov brought a change of outfit during all the mutineering. You'd think they could at least send a ship. Damn it, Jim. McCoy would be excellent at cinema sins. Also, why can't the Vulcans take them back to Earth? Sarek was on Vulcan at the end of the last movie and seems to have made the trip at least once. I just wish we could cloak the stench. That's racist. Thankfully, just in case a Vulcan ever died but was then resurrected months later because of a science experiment to rapidly grow life on planets, they had a ritual for that. No one will be seated during the scene where Spock proves he is obnoxiously smart. How do you feel? 
Look, I'm not even half Vulcan, and I would not only hesitate if a computer asked me this question, I might even wig the f*** out. Spock's mom has some really good things to... It's impacting on all our systems. Yellow alert. She is up. The ship is faced with a totally alien probe without clear intent, and they weren't at least at yellow alert already? Emergency lights. Shouldn't the emergency lights come on automatically in, oh, I don't know, an emergency? Wait, didn't you get blown up two movies ago? Kirk is getting a full report of all the ship repairs, but everyone omits that someone decided to redecorate the entire damn bridge since we last saw it. Onboard computer will interface with Federation memory bag. Wait, really? That's f***ing amazing. Holy sh**. Do you not even want to know why? Doesn't this mean the Klingons were dangerously close to mimicking Federation computer could Why am I the only one concerned about this? I have replaced the Klingon food packs. They were giving me a sour stomach. Okay, first of all, why were you eating the Klingon food packs in the first place? Second, you replaced them only after you got a sour stomach? So all the first aboard folks were just eating Klingon sh until you, precious you, got sick? Third, what did you replace the Klingon food packs with? I assume Federation food packs, no? Maybe Vulcan food packs. My question is, if they were so nearby and handy, why did you ever even take a single bite of a Klingon food pack? May your journey be free of incident. Live long and prosper, Lieutenant. That's a weird way of saying, hey, remember when I was a teenager and we banged? Him, back at his post like nothing happened. I don't know if you've got the whole picture or not, but he's not exactly working on all thrusters. Listen, I may just let McCoy take the rest of this script. I am not needed here. Launch all vessels. Launch all vessels. This is the tardiest command ever. Literally, as the space dock is getting shut down by the probe, they call out for vessels to launch. Late! This is Leia yelling evacuate after the Death Star fired on Alderaan. The Excelsior is still in space dock. Is this the only ship in Starfleet that doesn't go to the stars? We have lost all internal power. Well, maybe you've lost all main power, but the screens behind you are powered by something, right? And the lights? You have some power, just not all power. Let's be specific, Junior. This is f***ing Starfleet. Uhura, what's on the comm channels? Very active, sir. Multiphasic transmissions overlapping. And you're only telling him this now? What if he hadn't asked? Once again, Earth has, for some reason, been left entirely defenseless. Shouldn't at least 10% of Starfleet be held back for planetary defenses? We haven't seen a single thing open fire on the probe, even pot shots from a distance. Holy sh**, this probe has caused a hurricane! If the probe is only looking for communication with humpback whales, why does it open with hurricane-level destruction? Why was the probe designed to look for whales, but destroy the planet if no whales were found? We cannot survive unless a way can be found to respond to the probe. You don't know that! You're making a huge assumption that responding to the probe will even make a difference. Hi, I'm Bones, and I'm totally wasted by this film. Evidently unaware that its transmissions are destructive. How the hell could you possibly discern that? Can you modify the probe's signals, accounting for density and temperature and salinity factors? Somehow, that the probe's focused on the oceans and millions of smart minds on Earth, only Kirk, out in deep space, thinks to run the probe's audio through various filters? Only Kirk? If my suspicion is correct, there can be no response to this message. Excuse me. Planet Earth is on the edge of destruction, but Spock would rather leave everyone in suspense than clue them in to his theory because... DRAMA! Humpbacks were heavily hunted by man. They've been extinct since the 21st century. Aha! This movie assumes there are no humpback whales in the future because their numbers were so low in the late 80s, but in 2022, there are over 130,000 humpback whales and they are no longer considered in danger, so f*** you, movie, for getting the future wrong. Does a species exist on any other planet? Did Kirk just ask if a species that went extinct in the 21st century somehow evolved simultaneously on another f***ing planet? Start your computations for time warp. The Star Trek time warp has got to be one of the biggest buried leads in pop culture history. Apparently time travel is as easy as flying around the sun super fast, and yet they never use it. Why doesn't Kirk use it to save his son, or prevent Khan altogether? And don't give me that preserving the timeline BS, because I've seen this movie, and I know Kirk in particular couldn't give a f about preserving sh**. The storm outside is so powerful, I think these windows might break. Let's put a sticky suction cup thing on the inside, one part of it. Brilliant! You're proposing that we go backwards in time, find humpback whales, then bring them forward in time, drop them off, and hope to hell they tell this probe what to go do with itself. Well, when you say it all out loud, it sounds kind of stupid. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. It's not a Star Trek movie if someone doesn't quote Shakespeare. <laughs> that seems incredibly serious, and yet it is not. Also, Uhura survives this. According to this movie, time travel means shape-shifting cloud heads that look like your friends. We are probably already visible to the tracking devices of the time. Then why didn't they set the cloak to automatically come on once they'd finished time warping? You guys have been here seconds, and the timeline is already f***ed. No one who watches the sky for a living sees this sh Admiral, 
I am receiving whale song. Really? Receiving? You're hearing it, maybe, if you have your instruments tuned as such, but they're not sending it to you directly. At best, you're intercepting, to be honest. Eavesdropper. Admiral, we have a serious problem. Would you please come down? You better come take a look at this cliche. It's these Klingon crystals, Admiral. The time travel drained them. This is so unfortunate and something we never could have seen coming, even though time travel has happened several times in our adventures. MacGuffin is MacGuffin. We won't have enough to break out of Earth's gravity to say nothing about getting home. Shouldn't the fact that the ship only had enough juice to get them there be something that immediately came up in Spock's calculations? I mean, there's no point traveling back in time to get a whale that you have no way of bringing back to the future. Also, they really didn't need to take the Klingon ship at all, did they? They could have taken as long as they wanted to find a better ship, because guess what? Time travel! It doesn't look all that different. Yes, it f***ing does! Set us down in Golden Gate Park. F***ing what? The internet tells me that 24 million people visit Golden Gate Park annually. Let's say in 84 it was half that. Even then, that's over 30,000 people per day, any one of which is going to be extremely confused by the addition of the invisible wall they just jogged into. Those of you in uniform, remove your rank insignia. Right, because those insignias will mean a bunch to these primitive paranoid 80s humans anyway. See that? No, and needed to juice. Fortunately for the timeline, these two men spontaneously agree to never speak of this again. Also, Uhura can apparently detect the location of whales from miles away, but not these two men that Sulu nearly landed on. We're still using money. We gotta find some. It is odd we are still using money, but once you understand the American oligarchy, it makes more sense. I'll give you one hundred dollars. Is that a lot? Here's the problem with trying to fund your time travel trip to the past. You have no idea what costs what. Also, I'd give all the sins back if this cut to a scene of all the Enterprise crew shoved into storage lockers at the train station like in Muppets Take Manhattan and Spock did Janice's line of I'll trade with anyone that has a jacuzzi. This is the first of several folks who live here that somehow cannot or will not give Chekhov and Uhura directions to the naval base at Alameda. Nobody pays any attention to you unless you swear every other word. That is f***ing not true, goddammit. Wait. The Cetacean Institute is the only museum in the world exclusively devoted to whales. Let's just go ahead and send SeaWorld and all marine parks for keeping creatures that like to roam for hundreds of miles captive in a space smaller than an NFL playing field. I love how the Whale Museum tour opens with horrific video of whales being slaughtered. <laughs> really sets the mood. Look how grossed out these ladies are, for f**k's sake. Today there are less than 10,000 specimens alive. Wait, there are 10,000 of these f**kers out there and Kirk and Spock get fixated on a very specific two of them? The hell? Uhura heard whale song from space! They couldn't ping the globe to find two wild whales to beam up? This entire subplot is a lie! Here, gaze on the whales that cannot move enough to not be visible to you from this spot. I want you guys out of here right now, or I call the cops. Instead of leaving, Kirk and Spock will continue to try and explain themselves. And why, I ask? You got the information you need, you found whales, now get out of there! It's not like you're actually going to get her to understand what the hell Spock was doing with her whale! Golden Gate Bridge! Admiral, we have found the nuclear vessel. Again, Uhura could scan for the whales, but couldn't scan for a damn nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Why did they have to physically see that sh before they were able to transport into it? There she is, from the Institute. If we play our cards right, we may be able to find out when those whales are leaving. My goodness, this is some extremely convenient BS. If they need to know when the whales are being released, why didn't they hang around at the Cetacean Center until they caught Jillian instead of relying on this total fluke of an interaction? What's going to happen when you release the whales? How the f*** could she know this? No one knows this. This isn't even a very long movie, but it is wasting so much time. We may be able to help you in ways that... Frankly, you couldn't possibly imagine. FYI, no successful threesome ever started out with this phrase, at least according to my research. I explained that you'd come all the way here from Edinburgh on appointment to study methods of manufacturing by Plexicorp, but they don't seem to know anything about it. This works. Also, I'm amazed McCoy thinks he can just invent place names and get away with it. Edinburgh indeed. Good looking ship. Here we 204, isn't it? Right on. I flew something similar back in my academy days. The color metal where you did. Just use the keyboard. The keyboard? How quaint. I am legit surprised they even still teach typing in the 23rd century. Why would they? Everything would be voice activated, if not thought reading sh**. Who would still know how to type besides Stephen King? But also, he's not hitting anywhere near enough keys to bring up a program that can handle his advanced ass f math with graphics. Timeline be damned, Scotty trades material knowledge from the 23rd century in exchange for the materials to build the tank for the whales. At some point, you just have to wonder if your efforts to save the future are actually guaranteeing said future is totally different from the one you left behind. The hell did she drive onto the grass for? Holy sh**, you couldn't have waited until the damn car was out of sight before transporting? Large mushroom pepperoni with extra onions and a Michelob, please. Holy sh**, she just ordered a disgusting pizza and product placement in the same breath. Great choice. And you, sir. Jesus f***ing Christ, she just ordered a large pizza. Does the waiter think that... Like that, too. Holy f***, 
He did order a second large pizza for the super small table. What the fuck is happening right now? You're upset about losing the whales, aren't you? You're very perceptive. Is he? On the tour earlier, you basically said, I love these whales as my children, while wearing a Whales or People 2 t-shirt. He's no more perceptive than a camera. If you're in a restaurant and they have a jar with unwrapped crispy breadsticks sitting out in the open air on your table like it's a container of goddamn salt, never eat those breadsticks. Do you realize how many COVIDs are on those things? I could take those whales somewhere where they'd never be hunted. Why is Kirk telling her this? Why does he need her help at all? Just beam those suckers up! What is it? I thought I told you never to call me. Would it really have been so hard to excuse yourself and take the call somewhere like, well, anywhere other than right in front of an already suspicious local? Don't tell me. You're from outer space. No, I'm from Iowa. I only work in outer space. Semantics. They get up to go, and the waiter walks up with one small metal tray and a bill. He even says who gets the bad news, and we get the joke about Kirk having no money because he's from the future, but they ordered two large pizzas! What the fuck is this highway robbery? I was expecting two huge-ass disgustingly top pizzas to show up, and then them having to figure out who gets to sit on the table and who had to hold theirs in their lap. And if you try and tell me she only ordered by the slice, I will slice you in half with my razor-sharp anger, because you don't order with sizes when pizza places are by the slice. You order by the number of slow Go f*** yourself. George and Gracie's transmitter. What's the radio frequency? Sorry, that's classified. Secret, maybe, but classified? That's a government term. Nothing about any whale is classified. If I have to, I'll go to the open sea to get them. Ash, you should have done in the first place. Instead, this movie had to have a love interest and sneak in a Michelob reference, so we got this storyline. Ecologically friendly science-knowing whale lady continues her personal assault on municipally owned grass. We apparently are getting a power drain. I mean, it must be coming from inside the ship. How would you know that? Scotty. We're ready for beam out. Sadly, there are communications issues right now that are directly impacting the plot, laddie. Wearing leather pants. Commander Pavel Chekhov, Starfleet, United Federation of Planets. They removed their rank insignias, but not their f***ing Starfleet IDs? I am Pavel Chekhov, a commander in Starfleet, United Federation of Planets. Service number 656-5827D. Did Chekhov just not get the memo about how they are in the past now and can't talk too much about the future, or what? This is a humorous scene, but Chekhov is not this dumb. Stop making Chekhov dumb! Of course he's a rusky, but he's a or something. Yikes! People act like Trek selling NFTs in 2022 is the first time the brand ever stepped outside its core values, but I say look at this shit right here, yo! Inclusivity for all, except Ruskies and that other word. You promised me an estimate on the dilithium crystals. It's going slowly, sir. It'll be well into tomorrow. That's not good enough, Mr. Scott. You've got to do better. Yes, because I'm sure the recrystallization of dilithium crystals is going slowly purely because Scotty just isn't trying hard enough. Okay, so the shock reveal here is that the whales are already gone by early morning instead of at noon, as they previously said. Shock! But the biggest shock is that they expect us to believe they could drain a tank that large in just a few hours. Anyone who ever rented or owned a home with a swimming pool knows it can take days to drain even small-looking amounts of water. You sent them away without even letting me say goodbye Jillian. to them? Somehow the news that George and Gracie have already been taken away is enough to convince Jillian that Kirk is telling the truth about being from the future. Because I have the faintest idea why else she would head back to Kirk unless she believed he had the capacity to help her. Look at the busted-ass peeling seat in that truck. Does this whale job pay in crackers or what? On a beautiful morning in Golden Gate Park, only the recently despondent whale scientist is here to witness this bizarre sight caused by the cloaking device. I know we've dumbled toward the polarity of the discount flux capacitor, but did you really need to waste energy on beaming her in? At this point, you may as well just open the damn door. We must help Chekhov. Is that the logical thing to do, Spock? No. But it is the human thing to do. But also, very much the logical thing to do. Pretty sure leaving Chekhov, dead or alive, in the 23rd century is not a smart idea. Also, this Spock is an emotionless bastard routine just feels like a wishy-washy attempt to acknowledge that this is a new Spock that is still discovering who he is. Considering the progress he's already made and the fact that it is all but forgotten in the following movies, I really have to wonder why they even bothered to address it at all. Will you help us? How? Well, we're gonna have to look like physicians. But she's a whale scientist. How's she supposed to help you? Well, I'll be damned. Dealing with medievalism here. <laughs> the whale lady just handed the future doctor the exact right tool for the job without being prompted. <laughs> yeah, I love this movie, but it is dumb as f How's the patient, doctor? He's gonna make it. He, he came in with a sheet. The officers tasked with making sure a suspected Russian spy isn't stolen both choose to check on the empty room instead of following the people escaping with an entirely unhidden suspected Russian spy. Although that is completely f***ing moot, because there is no reason why they couldn't have just transported from the damn operating theater. 
This movie makes it canon that a transporter beam intended for one person can actually transport two people if one person jumps into the other's arms at the last second, and that is hella stupid! Also, also, talk about a Klingon, am I right? I'll leave. This man was in a coma mere minutes ago. Acceleration is no longer a constant. Yes, Spock. Guessing is not in my nature, Doctor. Look, there was no f***ing way that this movie was going to end with them getting the whales, but then failing to get back to the future because Spock's guess ended up being wrong. So quit bullshitting us with this weak sauce attempt at building tension and show us the Enterprise A. For maximum drama's sake, there is already a whaling ship about to hone in on and kill George and Gracie. That's cherry-picking even Ovechkin would be impressed by. Yes, that's a hockey joke, but if you know hockey, it's a really f***ing good one. Behold, one of the most bonkers yet badass images in the history of Star Trek. I want to screenshot it, put it on a canvas, and mount it in my bedroom. You know, it's ironic. When man was killing these creatures, he was destroying his own future. Nothing like having the movie's underlying message figuratively spoon-fed to us by the lead protagonist. Brown cushion. Keep the nose up if you can. He just said he had no controls. I have no controls, sir. They just sully Sullenberger to Klingon bird of prey in the fog during a storm with no controls and a huge bridge in their way. We interrupt your Star Trek movie to bring you two minutes and 25 seconds of whale song. I know Spock communicated their intentions to George and Gracie, but I still find it hard to believe that they didn't respond to the probe by saying, these bastards killed us all. Feel free to fuck them up at your discretion. Dude, don't look right now, but at your three o'clock, Jerry's wearing that wrestling rapper Hari Krishna outfit again. Because of certain mitigating circumstances, all charges but one are summarily dismissed. James T. Kirk, it is the judgment of this council that you be reduced in rank to captain. It is amazing what you can get away with as long as the good shit you do comes after all the bad shit you did. We all want to see Kirk back on the bridge, but damn it, this is the laziest way to get him there. It's not like this is the first time they've saved the world or even the galaxy. So do those times not mean shit just because they were years prior? You're going to your ship, I'm going to mine. Science vessel. The biggest sin in the entire film is that they not only take this 1980s Earth woman into the future with them just because Kirk kissed her, but that they then assign her immediately to a science officer position on a starship. Like, does Starfleet Academy not exist? Or do old Earth experience credits transfer directly in this case? She will be worthless on a starship as a science officer. And she won't be near her f buddy Kirk. Wouldn't she be better off as an expert overseeing George and Gracie's new life in 8390? We'll get a freighter. With all respect, Doctor. I'm counting on Excelsior. Here the crew is on their way to their new ship, even though they have not yet been told what that ship is, because that's how that shit works. It would be impossible to discuss the subjects without a common frame of reference. You mean I have to die to discuss your insights on death? I find it illogical that its intention should be hostile. You think this is its way of saying hi there to the people of the Earth? Why don't you stay here? No way. Somebody's got to keep an eye on him. The probe's transmissions are the songs sung by whales. That's crazy. Who would send a probe hundreds of light years to talk to whales? Start your computations for time warp. You're proposing that we go backwards in time, find humpback whales, then bring them forward in time, drop them off, and hope to hell they tell this probe what to go do with itself. You're really going to try time travel in this rust bucket? Transparent aluminum? That's the ticket, laddie. Realize, of course, if we give him the formula, we're altering the future. A simple evacuation of the expanding epidural hematoma will relieve the pressure. My God, man. Drilling holes in his head's not the answer. The artery must be repaired. In case you confused it with Nimbus 3 Montana. This guy seems to be looking around fairly normally. So does that mean he's seeing the horse in slow motion as well? I can't believe you'd kill me. For a field of empty holes? If history tells us one thing, it's that men have done far worse for far fewer holes. A starship? There are no starships on Nimbus 3. Perhaps I have a way to bring one here. I mean, this does kind of end up working out for Cybok, but goddamn, why wouldn't he at least go to a planet where he had more than one f***ing option? I remember thinking the biggest bunch of bullshit fan service any Star Trek film did was Banana Float Crumple Snatch dramatically announcing he was Khan in Star Trek Into Darkness to a bunch of characters that had zero clue who he was. However, Cybok showing his ears so we know he's got something to do with Spock, but discount Michael Berryman just thinks, oh, he's Vulcan, all right, is a close runner-up. Also, what the f*** was any of that? Am I supposed to know who these people are? Where are the whales? Where are my stars? Oh. Well, sh 62 seconds of mass starbationary opening credits. Would it have really been that big of a deal to give the rest of the main cast from the television series equal starring credit with Shatner, Nimoy, and Kelly? Get the f*** out of here with this co-starring bullshit. 
In case you confused it with Yosemite National Park Tatooine. In a Star Trek film directed by William Shatner, our introduction to any of the Enterprise crew is a shot of Shatner's ass. Somehow that actually checks out. The movie has time for three full minutes of someone in a Halloween mask climbing El Capitan. When does the trekking of the stars happen? You'll have a great time, Bonds. You'll enjoy your shore leave. Well, at least this time you're not getting chased around by a giant bunny rabbit, so that's a plus, right? Which reminds me that an episode of TOS where Bones is chased around by a giant bunny rabbit is so much better than this movie, and I feel a sin hippity hopping its way to us right now. Greetings, Captain. Either these boots are so loud that Kirk should have heard Spock's entire ascent, or Spock is a total dick for jump scaring Kirk while he's free climbing. I'm gonna send both and blame it on quantum fluctuations in the flux simpacitor. Hi, Bones! Mind if we drop in for dinner? If this is the kind of joke you enjoy, then you're in luck. Star Trek V will be your favorite movie of all time. Take me down to the Paradox City where the women are cats and they have three titties. Oh, won't you? Also, I almost want to congratulate the film for ripping off the tri-boob character from Total Recall a full year before its release. Almost. Hey, Harv, we need a game for the aliens to play on Nimbus 3. Hmm, okay, Bill, what about a literal pool table? But the balls have to roll through what looks like watered-down semen. Harv, you're a genius. One of the many, many reasons that make The Undiscovered Country a better movie is that it doesn't waste its casting of David Warner. Heck, even TNG did a better job. You had David f***ing Warner and you blew it, Final Frontier. You blew it! There are four cents! Cigarettes are apparently still a thing 300 years in the future. My charming companion here is the Klingon console, Cord. <laughs> For anyone who thought Worf bumping his head in Star Trek Insurrection was the lowest common denominator for Klingon humor, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, would like you to hold its Romulan ale. Twenty years ago, our three governments agreed to develop this planet together. Captain, she cannot take any more! Prepare for emergency exposition dump! Nimbus 3, the planet of peace and unity, welcomes all species, as long as they can read English. Prisoners? We're already prisoners here on this worthless lump of rock! That's Nimbus 3 -est. And once again, the Excelsior is in f***ing space dock. I'm beginning to think the ship was commissioned specifically to hide the Enterprise for these dramatic reveals. I think this new ship was put together by monkeys. While Scotty would definitely think something like this and maybe say it to co-workers, I don't buy for a second he would say this in an official Federation log. It's like everyone involved thought it was really cool that they completely changed the character of Han Solo into a lovable goofball in Return of the Jedi and were damn determined to do that to every Enterprise crew member in this movie. Uhura, I thought you were on leave. As poorly as she's used in this movie, that probably would have been better for Nichelle Nichols. Red, red, red. Alert. Red. I just fixed Alert. that damn thing. Surely it's beneath the chief engineer of the goddamn Enterprise to be fixing a warning alarm. Delegate, Mr. Scott. Don't you have a nephew that could be doing this? Red alert. This is a red alert. Enterprise acknowledge. I can't think of a single damn time Starfleet has made contact by saying red alert. Why would you open with something that could so easily be confused with an actual bridge alarm? The ship's in pieces and we've got less than a skeleton crew aboard. I will never understand why Trek writers think we won't be invested in the story unless the Enterprise is in pieces and under crude. And since it's barely even mentioned in the rest of the movie, why can't we just have a nice Enterprise to play with? And now begins six minutes of Kirk, McCoy, and Spock eating beans, drinking whiskey, and singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. This movie wastes so much time. It does have a flavoring I'm not familiar with. Aha, that's the secret ingredient. Secret ingredients! Tell me what I'm putting in my mouth, damn it. Whiskey. Tennessee whiskeys. I'm not sure if it's refreshing or sad that in the 23rd century, Tennessee will be most notable for its production of whiskey. I've always known. I'll die alone. And what an amazing and honorable character death that will be if the franchise ever decides to kill him. An inspiration for generations of Trek fans, I'm sure. A marshmallow. Well, I'll be there. A marshmallow. I thought I was losing my goddamn mind, but Spock does say Marshmelon here and nobody acknowledges it. Apparently some version of the script had McCoy fucking with a library computer in Spock's room and getting it to misspell Marshmallow because somehow he knew Spock would be researching camping and because haha, -ha, that'd be hilarious. But none of that shit was even filmed. So how did this make the final cut? Pioneer 10 was launched in 1973 and by this time, presuming it continued on uninterrupted, would have ended up somewhere like 800 AU away from Earth or 0.012 of a light year. All that to say, this is super Super f***ing close to Federation space and Earth for a Klingon bird of prey to be attempting f***ing target practice. What talatin on what revolution on? Taj. Go do Taj. Nech bej divi. But how is Claw this certain of that happening? Just because Talbot is a human, Claw can't know for sure that he's a priority for the Federation to come to the rescue. Character actions in this movie rely way too much on the ability to foreshadow enemy plans that could just as easily not happen. Just because they all do happen the way they are predicted doesn't make them any less bullshit. Why didn't you beep my communicator? 
You forgot to take it with you. I can believe that Kirk would leave his communicator behind. I could even buy that Bones would do the same. But there isn't a Ferengi's chance in Vegas that Spock would have left his behind as well. Also, Kirk went f***ing free climbing with no method of communication in case, you know, Spock wasn't there to ex machina him. And despite his protests, so did McCoy! Fun fact, Leonard Nimoy had no idea the cameras were rolling at this point. This was just his expression for 90% of production. It is the 23rd century and apparently we still need to use f***ing removable steps to disembark from a shuttlecraft. There must be other ships in the quadrant. Other ships, yes but no experienced commanders. Imagine trying so hard to avoid the Enterprise as the only available ship cliche that you don't see yourself falling into the gravitational well of Shatner's ego, thereby creating an even dumber contrivance to get the plot going. Also, what has happened to Starfleet to make Kirk the only captain capable of dealing with a hostage situation? Since when was he a f***ing qualified hostage negotiator? Also, also, if you're so strapped for experienced officers, why have you stacked the ones you do have all on the same damn ship? I'd ask who was crewing Excelsior, but it clearly doesn't matter since the damn thing never leaves space dock. Your orders are to proceed to Nimbus 3. It has taken 30 minutes to get to the start of this movie. To pray. Uh. Star Trek movie has a Klingon character with a hard-on for killing Kirk cliche. What is going on with this hostage tape, and why does it have more imaginative camera work than the movie it's inside of? You look like you've just seen a ghost. Perhaps I have, Captain. But I shall choose to withhold any further information until we have moved to a far more dramatic and moody location. Much better. Who is it he reminds you of? There was a young student. Exceptionally gifted. Spock's position! Transporter room, stand us. Transporter is still in operative. You mean the transporters that could wrap up this mission in seconds aren't working? How did Shatner come up with such original brilliance? No one has an issue with the captain and first officer of an already limited crew leading this extremely dangerous rescue mission. Most of the special effects in Star Trek movies are handled by the legendary Industrial Light and Magic, with the glaring exception of this movie, which was entrusted with the same company that worked on Little Shop of Horrors. That's all I really need to say about that. Then it's fortunate that I have you and your starship to protect me. Fortunate? It's downright ridiculous that this was Cybok's plan. He wants to lure in a ship by kidnapping diplomats from the three most powerful races in the galaxy. But this only works if the ship being sent doesn't have transporters. What if the Enterprise wasn't in pieces? What if the Romulans or Klingons turned up first? Wait a minute. Perfect. Kirk said convenient horses are convenient, strangely. Yeah. She make I can't work out what's more jaw-dropping here, that Kirk asked Uhura to do this, that Shatner asked Nichols to do this, or that both the Enterprise crew and the movie crew were okay with this. Also, where is the music coming from? Why is Uhura even on this away mission? This movie is dumb. Hello, boys. The power of boners, man. The only true universal constant. Phasers on stun. Whoa, Nelly. What happened to... Assess the situation and avoid a confrontation if possible. As usual, Kirk seems to have interpreted that as shoot first and dodge the court-martial later. It wasn't bloodshed I wanted! Considering that we're about to find out what Cybok does in fact want, cliched bloodshed probably would have made for a better movie. Did Spock just Vulcan net pinch a horse? I'm pretty sure Spock just Vulcan net pinched a horse. Kirk is addicted to this establishment's neon signage for no discernible reason. Kirk wanders into this bar completely alone with no idea as to how many reinforcements Cybok has or basically any kind of fucking clue what's waiting for him. <laughs> Kirk throws the cat lady into a shallow pool and assumes she's dead. There's no way she should be dead. Go get her out of there! What happened to setting the phasers to stun? Spock! Cybok's journey of discovery continues to warp the very fabric of all that is likely and probable by managing to lure in the one ship in the entire universe that is carrying his estranged half-brother. Position bird of prey. Closing. You think? Fairly certain he wanted something slightly more specific than they're still there. Yo, wait! Did you... They're only cloaking now. Why weren't they cloaked already? The Klingons are always cloaked. Did Shatner watch any Star Trek before making this movie? Once we've taken control of your vessel, we'll bring up the rest of our followers. How do they expect to overpower even the skeleton crew of the Enterprise with just the followers they could fit into the shuttle? Especially when five of those slots are taken by Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Uhura, and Sulu. Stand by to execute emergency landing plan B. What's emergency landing plan B? Kirk's plan is to bring the shuttle in without using the Enterprise's tractor beam, which isn't actually that wild of an idea. In fact, wouldn't this be the next logical alternative if the tractor beam broke down? Hell, why is this barricade even here if this maneuver is as outrageous as everyone seems to think? Also, the dangerous part of this plan isn't the landing or the barricade. It's Sulu apparently jumping the shuttle to warp goddamn nine for the approach. Meanwhile, on Star Trek The Animated Series. So Kirk and Spock said, To get us inside and re-raise the shields will take 
Exactly, 15.5 seconds. Which was apparently way too long and risky to attempt. Well, in plan B, the shields were down for a total of 14 seconds, assuming they were immediately raised when the shuttle landed, and all it took was Sulu nearly killing everyone on the shuttle and taking half the Enterprise with them in the process to gain that one second. Worth it? Kirk, Spock, and McCoy chose to f***ing stand for this maneuver? We must change course. At once. I hear you, man, but we're already at the 50 minute mark, so let's just write this off to experience and bring Meyer back for the next one, okay? You must kill me. Or shoot him in the leg. I'll probably do it too. Bad guy decides to keep the main characters all in the same brig instead of separating them. Fortunately, they'll spend the majority of their time arguing about Spock not murdering a family member instead of actually trying to escape. If I had pulled the trigger, Cyborg would be dead. Unless you shot him in the goddamn leg. F Cyborg also is a son of Sarek. Spock has a sibling no one knew about cliche, honestly. This happening twice is f***ing bizarre. You mean he's your brother, brother? I really thought there was a line from the song Miss Jackson by Outkast that rhymed with brother, brother, like mother, mother. But after five minutes of scouring through the video, I realized I was thinking of forever, ever. And then this led me on a 23 minute rabbit hole of Cobra Starship songs, don't ask. But in total, I spent 28 minutes trying to come up with a sin for this ridiculous bit of dialogue. And now I have bring it snakes on a plane stuck in my head for the rest of the day. Are you happy, Star Trek V? I have so many questions about why this toilet can't be used in space dock and no desire to have them answered. Why is Cybok on a different turbo lift than Sulu and Uhura? Why are there two different access points to turbo lifts on the bridge? Why didn't Leighton Meester have a bigger singing career after singing with Cobra Starship on the hit song Good Girls Go Bad? I have so many questions. This is the new brig, Captain. It is escape proof. How do you know? The designers tested it using the most intelligent and resourceful person they could find. This is, of course, Spock talking about himself, and obviously Spock is very smart, but I still don't understand why the designers would use him. Why wouldn't you use someone that has already escaped a break? They could use either a former criminal turned good, or whatever this century's version of Sylvester Stallone's escape plan character is. They made love with their hearts. I'm not here to judge alien mating rituals, but this seems like a very messy and unnecessarily dangerous way to pawn your farce. My brothers, we have been chosen to undertake the greatest adventure of all time. Greatest adventure? Really? Bill and Ted got to collect history's greatest minds and leaders like action figures. Indiana Jones found the fucking Ark of the Covenant in the Holy Grail. Lawrence of Arabia, well, he did something. I've never actually watched all of that movie, but always tell people I have because those LOA fans be passionate. Well, now I've admitted it to everyone. Are you happy, Star Trek V? Is what possible? That he's found Shakari. The reason Cyborg left Vulcan. Spock f***ing knew this was his plan, and he's only sharing it now? He's making a goddamn intergalactic Olympic sport out of burying the lead. Which lies beyond the Great Barrier. At the center of the galaxy. Center of the galaxy. Where Shakari is fabled to exist. So if Shakira is fabled to be in the center of the galaxy, why is Spock so shocked that Cybok knows where to go? He hasn't found sh**. He's just following a myth that everyone apparently already knows. Believe. It is a primitive form of communication known as Morse code. If the Federation no longer practices Morse code, why does the person currently using it think Spock, Kirk, and Bones will understand what message they are trying to communicate to them? C. K. Back. Stand back. Stand, Stand back. back! Also, despite only translating half the Morse code taps, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy get the entire message. Fortunately, the missing taps spelled out, don't worry, I'll wait until you start translating before starting the actual message. Also, also, what's the point of a stand back warning if you only give them four seconds to stand back? Especially when you haven't got a clue if they've even heard or understood the message. What are you standing around for? Do you not know a jailbreak when you see one? Screaming a bit louder, Scotty. I don't think they quite heard you around the moons of Nibia. I know this ship like the back of my hand. <laughs> I'll admit, this scene cracked me up when I was a kid, and as a result, it still gets a chuckle out of me now, but it's dumb. Dumb! Scotty isn't dumb! Could you imagine this shit happening in the Wrath of Khan? And it adds nothing to the plot. Scotty will briefly be in sickbay, and then we'll be inexplicably back helping Kirk before the end of the movie. I believe I found a faster way. Spock likes these surprise arrivals so much he managed to pull his anti-grav boots out of his ass, found an alternative route to their end destination that Scotty apparently doesn't know about that allowed him to beat Kirk and McCoy to the top, all so that he could descend down this original shaft to surprise them. We do not have time for your green-blooded shenanigans! The people of your planet once believed their world was flat. The question is, at what point between now and the year 2279 can we actually start using this sentence ourselves? Wait outside. They already are outside the door. Unless Cybok means outside outside, in which case they would be dead. I'm here. I'm with your dad. Look, I'm always happy to see McCoy given more to sink his teeth into, but couldn't we have trimmed this down slightly and got to see what Sulu, Uhura, or Chekhov's hidden pain was? This pain has poisoned your soul for 
long time. This movie has poisoned me and many other Trek fans for a long time. I feel like Bone should suffer with the rest of us. What is this? I believe we are witnessing my birth. I understand that this would be the genesis of Spock's pain, but if this process is about unveiling trauma, why are we seeing something he couldn't possibly remember? Isn't it more likely to be an actual conversation he had from his youth? I have found myself and my place. I know who I am. And I cannot go with you. We get a beautiful speech from Spock explaining why he can resist Cybok's brainwashing and why he can't go with him. All we get from McCoy is... I guess you better count me out, too. And it's almost impressive how much this one line manages to undercut the power of what Spock shared and the willpower of the entire damn crew who couldn't resist. Mr. Sulu, full ahead. We get zero explanation for why the Enterprise is able to survive this trip. What was blowing up all the probes? So, Frank, how exactly are we going to show the Great Barrier when they get to it? Well, George, remember that acid trip we took by watching the 1978 version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers? And while watching the opening credits, we thought we were pollinating our own minds with the spores and that seven babies would just pop out of our heads? Of course, I'll never forget that. Well, I'm going for a visualization of that, but I'm painting it blue. Why blue, Frank? F*** if I know, George, I'm on acid currently. Are we dreaming? Sadly, no. All this bullshit is canon. We can't play it, but trust me when I say that this is the most unearned use of the iconic Star Trek theme ever. And I don't mean just to date, I mean in perpetuity. I don't care if one day it ends up scoring the reveal of a new and improved Millennium Falcon, it will still be less jarring than this bullshit. Shakari. Q. E2. For Tavor. Excitement? Michelle Nichols is standing right f***ing there and you can give her one of these lines. It's not like a casting Donna Murphy instead of letting Gates McFadden have the emotional moments with Picard and Star Trek Insurrection kind of bullshit. But not only does Star Trek V ignore half of the crew for the majority of the runtime, when they do give them something to do, it's embarrassing as f***. Cyborg, Spock, Dr. McCoy, come with me. Kirk says he wants to handle this by the book and then invites Cyborg, his f***ing kidnapper, to go on the away mission with him. What book is he going by? Because that decision can't be part of the Starfleet book. The land, the sky. Just as I knew it would be. You mean you knew it would look like a Californian desert with a Parma violet filter? Seems oddly specific if you ask me. What the hell is recording this footage? The shuttlecraft is right there. Why not make it from its point of view and save yourself a sin? Scotty, you gotta see this. You better come take a look at this cliche. No trek is complete without it. I mean, this is literally the same transporter room and corridors from the next generation. What did they spend the 33 million on? Did they actually hire God? What kind of ass backwards security system would prioritize a written recommendation over a definitely audible alarm? Enterprise, uh, this is Kirk. Uh, we have a. Uh... Unfinished script? Believe it or not, these ridiculous shock erections are only 10% as bonkers as what Shatner originally proposed for the finale. I'm not saying it would have saved the film by any means, but the budget cuts mid-production certainly didn't do it any favors. Good thing no one was standing on the parts of the ground where the sh** was shooting up from. Could say God was watching. I mean, you shouldn't say that because it's ludicrous, but you could. Brave souls. Welcome. The sequence packs about as much suspense as a ride at Epcot. This feels like a bullshit add-on to Spaceship Earth that would have been removed from the exhibit after a couple of years that they would just add Nemo to it. What does God need with a starship? This line has become iconic enough in the history of Star Trek that I will begrudgingly take a sin off. I guess. When you speak of me to future generations, if you could leave the part out where I removed a sin from Star Trek V, I would appreciate it. I couldn't help but notice your pain! My pain? It runs deep. Share it with me! <laughs> what? This super being entity thing is physically there? The Cybok duplicate just apparated out of nowhere. Could it have just disappeared again? What is Cybok grabbing onto here? Enterprise, are you ready? In firing position. Torpedo armed. Kirk's ingenious plan is to fire a torpedo at the super being entity thing, which is dumb, but you know what? I'm sure it'll fucking work, because what does God need with a cohesive plot anyway? Please tell me the transporter is working. She's got partial power, so I might be able to take two of you. Well, that's what you get for tying the transporter buffers directly into the third act climax deregulator. Now, just a <laughs> McCoy's vocal cords still work while being deconstructed into their constituent atoms and beamed through space. Also non-consensual transporting. The Klingons are here, too. They need to rename that thing the Galactic Revolving Door for all the good it's doing barring entry. <laughs> Looks like God went to the Icarus from Eternal School of Missing While Aiming with Your Eye Lasers. I'm sorry, but it's hard to be intimidated by a growl that sounds like he stepped on a Lego. Wait, why is Kirk cheering here? He has no idea that the bird of prey is on his side. I bet Shatner was hoping this shockingly bad green screen was going to cover the fact that he forgot which ship was meant to be appearing. That might feel like a stretch, but I'm just trying to keep up with the theme of the movie. My junior officer has something he wants to say to you. Yeah, Shatner! I apologize. 
This decorated general dishonors his fellow Klingon by making him do the most un-Klingon thing possible. Apologize! This is the perfect illustration of why this movie doesn't work. A contrivance of events strung together by dad jokes and a bafflingly poor grasp of the source material. Please, Captain. Not in front of the Klingons. Okay, fine. I'll take a sin off for this too, but purely because I feel like I owe this specific line some sort of royalty check for the amount of times I use it to get out of awkward public displays of affection. One of the biggest crimes of this movie is that it takes Chekhov and Sulu and makes them clueless buffoons in the first act, zombie buffoons in the second act, and lecherous buffoons in the finale. What a waste. According to this view, they are apparently having this shindig while still beyond the galactic barrier. Do they not need to report back to Starfleet and tell them the hostages are safe? The Enterprise is no longer being commanded by a zealot and God has been torpedoed? I lost a brother once. I was lucky I got him back. Because f you, Samuel Kirk. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. No, 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 no. I gotta open with a sin off for Nicholas Meyer, who was asked not once, but twice, to write the franchise's ship, and goddammit if he didn't do a stellar job of it both f***ing times. Stardate 9521.6. Captain's Log, USS Excelsior. Sulu gets to be the f***ing captain of his own starship, and Takei still got a f***ing also starring credit for the film. F this franchise is disrespect of any original cast member not named William, Leonard, or DeForest. Hey, they took Excelsior out of space dock! Starships are like hockey prospects. You don't trust them to be ready for the big leagues for at least several years. We're heading home under full impulse power. Why, though? I mean, sure, they only go up to warp 9 when the sh hits the fan, but warp 2 or 4? Should be no problem. This is like driving home from vacation at 10 miles an hour. I love how Excelsior has a giant schematic drawing of itself on the bridge. There's probably a small arrow with text pointing to the bridge saying, You are here. Let's pause and discuss this sh Dude here has brought a device with important information for the captain to see, but that device is huge! Looks like an action figure box! He brought a whole ass board game to show Sulu the latest weather reports. This is the far future! Shouldn't this device be super tiny? Shouldn't the information be displayable on the main screen? The Excelsior survives this. Also, look at these poor bastards getting thrown from their beds. Why are there never any seatbelts in space? Sudden yeoman ran, blah blah blah. It's great to see Grace Lee Whitney, but I still hate the way Star Trek thrusts these f***ing easter eggs in your face with this weak weak nut nut bullshit. I've confirmed the location of Praxis, but... What is it? I cannot confirm the existence of Praxis. Why the f*** would you need to confirm the location of a known Klingon moon? It exists where it exists, based on the principles of physics. You only said it this way so the existent part would sound ominous. No one was questioning the location of Praxis. Then Sulu says on screen, and they show pictures of a blown up Praxis. Like, how f***ing many times is the optical zoom on Excelsior's camera? This kind of image would be literally impossible unless they had camera beacons strewn throughout space and... Come to think of it, Starfleet should definitely invest in a network of space cameras. This transmission ends. Now. Unnecessary words. They will have depleted their supply of oxygen in approximately 50 Earth years. I'm having a hard time believing that one planet or moon is responsible for sustaining the entire Klingon species. There aren't other planets they can move to in the Klingon Empire? Maybe they can't. But the movie doesn't do a great job explaining why this is impossible. Even with the overspending on their military that Spock is about to mention, wouldn't asking for a little moving money from the Federation make more sense than asking them to dismantle all the space stations and weaponry along the neutral zone? Negotiations for what? The dismantling of our space stations and star bases along the neutral zone. An end to almost 70 years of unremitting hostility. Unremitting means incessant or never relaxing. But in the original series, the Organian Peace Treaty was signed between the Klingons and the Federation, which would have 100% relaxed some of the hostility between the two warring factions. I'm not saying there wouldn't need to be some talks, but Spock is acting like there's never been anything done to assist allowing both the Federation and the Klingons to come to a mutual agreement. Me? Well, there are Klingons who feel the same way about the peace treaty as yourself and Admiral Cartwright. But they'll think twice about attacking the Enterprise under your command. <laughs> what? Kirk is one step away from retirement, and these movies believes that Kirk and his crew are the only ones capable of stopping whatever big bad comes Starfleet's way it says a lot more about the lack of an ability to recruit successfully than it does about how great Kirk is at manning a starship. Also, why does the Federation think Kirk being at the helm will stop the Klingons from trying to attack? The whole f***ing reason Claw attacked the Enterprise in Star Trek V was because Kirk was at the helm. This logic is bullshit. But a full ambassador would be better equipped if there's no further business. Kirk pauses before he's interrupted. We volunteer. Who's this eavesdropper in the chair back here? There's an old Vulcan proverb. Only Nixon could go to China. Har har. This movie will do this again here in a few with the Shakespeare and the original Klingon, and it's nonsensical, unfunny, and frustrating. Don't believe them. Don't trust them. They are dying. Let them die. 
Look, Kirk has never had any love for the Klingons, but this racist grandpa character they make Kirk out to be in this film comes out of left field. I can't believe I have to keep using Star Trek V to defend my points, but in that movie, Kirk has zero qualms with not only saving the Klingon ambassador, but also the Romulan ambassador. And then even accepts Ambassador Kord's help at the end of the film. The man clearly can work with Klingons when the Federation needs him to. Captain on the bridge. Ah, sex in the sideburns. I mean sideburns in the city. I guess we'll be going down together. I mean getting off together. Scotty is smiling because he knows none of his nephews can die on this mission. I've never trusted Klingons. And here's a visual reminder about the search for Spock that hopefully sells this notion, even though that was three movies ago. After he says the damning audio that comes back to haunt him later, we pan by the doorway and there was no one there at all. F***ing movie is a liar. Just like my college girlfriend who said she did kiss that townie Bryson but did not go all the way with him only for her to come up pregnant with Bryson's baby two months later. F***ing townies. You could have knocked. Or, and hear me out here, Starfleet could design cabin doors to only open when the occupant agrees to it. Ah! Movie takes Valeris from Kirk quarters to Spock's quarters with only a standard exterior Enterprise shot in between. And I'm not proud of the wording, but Lieutenant Valeris sure gets around, doesn't she? Faith? Let the universe will unfold as it should. That's not faith, that's apathy. I intend you to replace me. In what capacity? Spock is a science officer and Valeris works at the helm. Shall we raise our shields, Captain? Never been this close. You have literally flown a Klingon ship in another movie. I am Chancellor Gorkhan. And it's totally coincidental that I sound exactly like St. John Talbot and Gold Madrid. No relation. I am curious why you only have three lights working on the bridge of your ship, though. Or maybe it's four. Guess who's coming to dinner. If guess who's coming to dinner is still a valid reference in the 23rd century, I'm not sure the society is as advanced as Star Trek would like us to believe. Also, there's a lot of space out there to cover. Why is Kronos One hovering so close to the Enterprise? The Klingons really need to work on teaching their helms people about personal space etiquette. As someone who has had many beards and various facial hair formations over the years, I can attest that the corners of the mouth are the hardest to keep clean as one eats. So the concept of someone growing facial hair only in that location is a huge red flag. They all look alike. That's racist, and I get that that's the point, but still, that's racist. You men have work. Yes, yes ma'am. Ma'am. I know Valeris says have work and not at work, but I've always wanted to sing that in a Sins video, and this might be the closest I get to fulfilling that dream. Also, right after Chancellor Gorkin is killed, if you just think back to this weird, uncomfortable moment, pretty obvious who the murderers are. Maybe it's great foreshadowing, but I'm an asshole, so you're still getting a sin. I offer a toast. The undiscovered country. <laughs> Roll credits. You'll not experience Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Klingon. I've always viewed this as trolling, but often I kind of wonder if Klingons actually think Shakespeare was from their planet, or stole from a writer from their planet. Will you be willing to give up Starfleet? The movie does a seamless job of replacing Kevin Spacey with Christopher Plummer. Please let me know if there's some other way we can screw up tonight. Torpedo shadowing! Also, Kirk is the one who played the Hitler card. Earth, Hitler, 1938. I'm not sure anyone else in his crew screwed anything up. Way to throw everyone under your own racist bus, Kirk. What is this sh here? It's a trophy, and there's a human riding a fish, but then there's a golden bowl. Just what the hell did he do to win this trophy? A note to the galley, Romulan ale no longer to be served at diplomatic functions. Considering Romulan ale is very much illegal, I'm having a hard time buying that Kirk would make this declaration part of any kind of official captain's law. Here are two phasers that are set to neither vaporize nor stun, but instead are set to blow a small hole through the person. Now a phaser is detaching an arm like a lightsaber gun? Just gonna add five cents here for all the times this movie doesn't understand Star Trek phasers. With all the blood drops flying around, how are these the first ones the assassins have come in contact with? With a direct torpedo hit, you crippled our entire gravitational field. But are the Klingons not trained in combat scenarios where the gravitational fields have failed? That would seem to be extremely important when you're operating in f***ing outer space. Klingon blood is Pepto-Bismol! <laughs> oh, but still, please have the sads for the dead. It's so pink, though! <laughs> Jim, I don't even know his anatomy. You've been at this for 30 years and you never learned Klingon anatomy? Also, if you don't, then why the f*** did you say you could help? Bones just said he didn't know the Klingon anatomy, but he is performing CPR in the same spot a human's heart would be. But how would he know that's where a Klingon's heart is? The discoloration at the top of this uniform collar tells me that Spock, the character, wears neck makeup. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Did you know that the president of the Federation plays the piano? Because I did not know that. Wait, that might be a harpsichord. There's also a model of the Eiffel Tower when the actual thing is outside in the window next to it. Starfleet engineers were all, what do we need at the communication station on the bridge? What we definitely cannot live without is a graphic single color rendering of the Enterprise spinning on two axes. Oh, uh, sir. The peace process will go forward. 
Why are they speaking English to each other? There are only Klingons in the room, and they were only speaking Klingon just a few seconds ago. Fortunately for the sake of the entire rest of the movie, and that patch on Kirk's shoulder, the Klingon criminal justice system does not believe in prison uniforms, so Kirk and McCoy are arrested, held, put on trial, sentenced, and delivered to prison, all while still in their Starfleet uniforms. If the gravitational unit was not functioning, how could these men be walking? They appeared to be wearing magnetic boots. Even the shittest of lawyers would be able to find out that information pre-trial and not be caught asking such an ignorant question. What would your favorite author say, Captain? Let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. Leading the witness. They do eventually deduce where the audio clip from his captain's log came from, but right now it's weird to me that no one watching this trial on the Enterprise or at Starfleet is immediately questioning how the Klingons got their hands on what should be a pretty secure and classified audio document. Do you deny being the motive of these charges? Don't wait for the translation! Answer me now! Christopher Plummer slam f***ing dunks this performance, but he's a general. Why is a general acting as a prosecutor, but the defense gets a regular lawyer? Is lawyer one of the steps in the military career track for the Klingons? This is the most important case in the history of our race! Then get me a four-star general! I'm not gonna risk losing this case! And if it should be proved that members of your crew did, in fact, carry out such an assassination... Kirk then says he is responsible for the behavior of those under his command, and the state rests! And I feel like everyone is forgetting about that if in General Chang's question, because it has not been proven yet that the people in helmeted Starfleet uniforms who shot the Chancellor were actually Starfleet members. Yes, that is shocking. Almost as shocking as the fact that the Enterprise is still out here. It had to have at least taken a day or two before the court proceedings, and even with pretending to have some communication systems down or whatever Uhura and Chekhov cooked up, wouldn't there be ships sent out for investigation purposes of the area where all this shit went down? Did Starfleet choose to do zero investigation into the matter? That doesn't make any sense. We fired. That is not possible. All weapons visually accounted for, sir. Which is something that was ridiculously not brought up at the trial. This is a fact that should require more investigation. The idea that no one would be investigating this outside the rogue Enterprise crew members is f***ing ludicrous. An ancestor of mine maintained that if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Now we have a non-Earth person creating Occam's Razor. Is the movie making a commentary that most of our philosophical and creative achievements are inevitably going to be reached, achieved by any sentient race, or is it just a cute joke? Spock is not descended from Occam. We must inform Starfleet Command. Inform them of what? A new weapon that is invisible? Scotty would be the chief engineer at CinemaSins. They'll say that we're so desperate to exonerate the captain that we'll say anything. And they would be correct. We have no evidence. But you so f***ing do have evidence. You have visual evidence that no torpedoes were fired from the goddamn Enterprise. Maybe that could be disproven if someone poked around enough, but it's still goddamn evidence. This is legitimately some of the worst fake snow I've ever seen. These are instant mashed potato flakes. I realize snow isn't easy to fake, but you wrote the script here, not me. This guy died in like 20 seconds of exposure to the surface, but all these prisoners have been out here walking for who knows how long and standing here getting lectured with their faces completely exposed. This will help keep you warm. Weed is legal in f***ing Klingon prisons? Can I move to Rurapente? Klingon weed's gotta be off the rails good. Why are there chefs in here preparing roasted turkeys and soups? Yes, the replicator didn't come about until Next Generation, but the original series still had food synthesizers that created food cubes, and the animated series in the 70s had fully realized looking meals coming from the synthesizers. My point is, Starfleet is absolutely wasting money having a full kitchen staff on Starship preparing traditional four-course meals and sh**. But also, you haven't had roasted turkey until you've prepared it in the traditional Klingon way. Why not simply leave? Vaporize them. Like this? Chekhov would f***ing know that you can't shoot a phaser on a starship without an alarm going off. He's a goddamn tactical officer. Also, instead of saying vaporizing things with phasers on ships sets off an alarm, she pulls a phaser from the kitchen wall-mounted armory, which is a thing apparently, and vaporizes a stockpot, but somehow not the mashed potatoes that were in the stockpot, and none of this makes any f***ing sense. When you vaporize a person, their skin doesn't disappear and leave their muscles and organs exposed. It vaporizes the skin and what was inside it. Did someone fire? off a phaser? Did someone send communications officer or her to check on an unauthorized phaser? Turns out this alien bully assassin has genitals on his knees, and look, if you have genitals on your knees, why do you wear pants with holes in the knees? But also, never has there been a more appropriate time for the high school cheer, rah rah re, kick him in the knee, rah rah rass, kick him in the other knee. Not everybody keeps their genitals in the same place, Captain. Anything you want to tell me? Even when he and his friends' lives are on the line, Kirk can't help but be a sexist, perverted prick. 
What kind of self-respecting gulag lets their prisoners sleep? Bones inexplicably decides not to roll over, but to completely change the head-foot notions of his own bed. Yes, this is because we want to see his face while he talks to Kirk in this scene, and it's called blocking, but this maneuver makes zero sense outside of a film set. Movie has time for this. Go to lift seven in the morning for mining duty. They let the prisoners in this gulag choose their own work details? Starfleet urgently requests any data we have. I was during research for this video years old when I learned that Christian Slater's mom was the casting director for this film. So did he do her a favor after an actor bailed, or did she do him a favor by giving him a cameo? Until I know the answer, this is getting us in. But also, this is the second character in this movie to pronounce the word Data wrong. Considering TNG has a character for seven seasons named Data with the other pronunciation, one has to assume this film's pronunciation is intentional affrontage to TNG. TNG in general, and Brent Spiner specifically. If they've been doing a ship-wide search for the boots, how was this pretty obvious blood spatter not already noticed? How was it not noticed before they even started the search? These ships have cleaning crews, right? This crime scene examining device also blinds the investigator's eye with a bright red light. Opening drawers, sorting through uniforms, scanning beds. Excitement? Last night, you two were... Don't remind me. All kinds of shaming. We're supposed to be rooting for Kirk, right? That prisoner who froze in 20 seconds on the surface is looking more and more like an outlier. I'm wearing a Viridian patch on my back! Star Trek had its own version of the only used once ever time turner from Harry Potter with this Viridian patch bullshit. Spock slapped it there just before we went on Gorkin's ship! Thankfully, the Klingons never searched us or scanned us or made us change clothes, miraculously. They tricked the Klingons here linguistically, but shouldn't the Klingons be able to detect ships by type or signature or something by now, rather than just relying on radio contact? Earlier in this movie, Sulu just used his ship's camera to see all the way to Praxis. What is your destination? Over! I continue to call bullshit on no one, including Uhura aboard this ship, who is a goddamn communications officer knowing the Klingon language. What? Pimpsey Doc! This works. Man, I think everyone took the wrong lessons away from Superman 3. Not me, you idiot. HIM! That's a bit of luck that never gets reconciled. I wonder why they weren't vaporized. How did none of the senior officers know about this goddamn shipwide phaser alarm? For someone who finished top of her class at Starfleet Academy, Valera should know that the officers she shot were dead when she left and realized this is a trap. You cannot prove anything. It's this kind of pride that got her excluded from the Sex and the City reboot. Klingons cannot be trusted. Yep, the entire movie's point is that there were enough racist dickheads in power that they almost succeeded in starting a war to kill the minority Klingons, and this is the reflection of modern-day America. Let them die, you said. He did, but he said that to Spock at the meeting where he was given his assignment to escort the Klingons. He didn't record that in a log, so Valeris would have no knowledge of that transaction. Unless that eavesdropper from before was working for her. She knows Spock can pull the truth out of her, and yet she still refuses to speak it aloud. What the f*** did the Klingons have on Valeris? Mind melding with another person without their explicit consent. Then we're dead. I've been dead before. <laughs> this movie's a blast. Contact Excelsior. She'll have the coordinates. You knew that, but you still wasted the last few minutes trying to break Lieutenant Valeris. If the CGI for Camp Kittimer is going to be so shitty, why not use a real Earth building with impressive construction incorporating nature? Dozens of those actually exist. I can see you, Kirk. Okay, huge sin question here. Can radio signals not be traced in space? The entire finale depends on the enemy ship being cloaked, but that same enemy ship is taunting the Enterprise throughout, as the radio signals are ubiquitous and elusive. The Enterprise will even go on to create a gas-seeking torpedo to track and eliminate the evil bad guy ship, but they could simply have tracked the radio signal, yeah? And if cloak ships have some way of hiding the radio signal, which is bullshit, then at least tell us that. You're the auxiliary power! Auxiliary circuits destroyed, Captain. Then why aren't you all dead? This is just techno babble about shit that has no ultimate bearing on the outcome of the story, but is only intended to cause the audience to worry. What about all of that equipment we're carrying to catalog gaseous anomalies? Yes, Aurora, what about that? because you guys were back home in San Fran, America, fiddle-farting away the last few months before retirement and only put out to space to meet up with the Klingon diplomats, so why the f*** does the Enterprise have gaseous anomaly-detecting bullshit fucking science gear on board? Things gotta have a tailpipe. A century or two beyond the gas-powered automobile, the term tailpipe has somehow survived and has become a common cultural touchstone. Target that explosion and fire. <laughs> God damn it, yes to the dead power! <laughs> F***ing rules. Movie steals the Klingon ship explosion from Star Trek Generations. Jesus, was the graphic puddle of blood next to his head really necessary? Slow claps. Course heading, Captain. Second star to the right. Stealing. And you people, you're all astronauts on some kind of Star Trek. You gotta admit one thing. Can't beat the view. So what do you like about being up here? Starfleet, do you have them? Enterprise, 
what we got back didn't live long. And it exploded. Of all the souls I have encountered in my travels, his was the most human. I'm gonna try and kiss recording. I'm going through some kind of Here it comes. If we can control it, persuade it, use it. Oh yeah! Here comes Kool-Aid! Here comes Kool-Aid! Nothing I can do about it, kid. I'm full power. I'm gonna have to shut down. They're not gonna get me without a fight. You can't win. But there are alternatives to fighting. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. I am the key master. I am the gatekeeper. Mr. Sulu, I had warp one. Warp one, sir. Heading, sir. Second start of the ride. And straight on till morning. I'm your doctor, and I'm your friend. I'm a politician, which means I'm a cheat and a liar. And when I'm not kissing babies, I'm stealing their lollipops. Hey, don't open that! It's an alien planet! Is there air? You don't know! My dear guests, I am Mr. Raw. Welcome to Fantasy Island. The plane! The plane! It's time to play the music! It's time to light the light! It's time to meet the Muppets on the Muppet Show tonight! Guess we'll be going down together. I mean, getting off together. I mean, that's okay. I'll just push the button for the stimulator. I mean, elevator. Admiral, please. Gosh darn it, I give up. It's yours, you can have it. You have to give me a minute to put it in a box for you. Deja vu. What did you just say? On the test, sir. How do you do it, Frank? How did you pass the bar in Louisiana? He's intelligent, but not experienced. This pattern indicates two-dimensional thinking. You're just not thinking fourth dimensionally. I'll get you next time, Gadget. Next time. This is the Nebuchadnezzar on approach requesting access through gate three. Nebuchadnezzar, this is Zion Control. Maintain present velocity and stand by. No, Jim, the Enterprise would never stand the pounding. And um, phrasing? Re No one would have believed in the early years of the 21st century that our world was being watched by intelligences greater than our own. Yeah, but this time I've got the money. Side elevator. Agents on their way up. Retreat to your exits. Agents are coming. Things have certainly changed around here. I remember when this was all farmland as far as the eye could see. Old man Peabody owned all of this. Enough of you! Why do you like them so much? Because they stand on a wall. We need uh, Dory. To find what are you doing? This what are you doing? Can you modify the probe signals accounting for density and temperature and salinity factors? I can try, sir. I think I have it, sir. We need uh, Dory. To find what are you doing? This what are you doing? Are you, are you fascinating. Start your computations for time warp. It's just a jump to the left. Did you hear a foghorn? No, scratch the golden gate. 
And you programmed all that from memory? My calculations are correct. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious sh Admiral, I am receiving whale song. Put them on speakers. We need... The time travel drained them. Well, they're giving out, decrystallizing. Give me a round figure, Mr. Scott. 1.21 San Francisco. Which, of course, in German means a whale's vagina. It's been a long road. About those colorful metaphors that we've discussed, I don't think you should try using them anymore. Chill out, dickwad. We apparently are getting a power drain. I mean, it must be coming from inside the ship. Hmm. We traced the call. It's coming from inside the house. Well, nobody's perfect. Why don't you get this nice camp? It's clever, just like you. Share your pain. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. You're a Vulcan. <laughs> An astute observation has led to laughter. <laughs> we are laughing. Hi, Bones. Mind if we drop in for dinner? That was not funny. Romulan, Terra, Klingon. Are you just looking at things in the office and saying that you love them? Prisoners? We're already prisoners here on this worthless lump of rock. This is Seti Alpha 5. Good night, Doctor. Good night, Spock. Good night, Ned. Oh, I had the strangest dream. But it wasn't a dream. It was a place. And you, and you, and you, and you were there. Ten thousand years will give you such a crick in the neck. God didn't do that, you did it. So it's me you want, you Klingon bastards. What are you waiting for? Damn you, God! Damn you all to hell! Batman is playing Galaga. Thought we wouldn't notice. From hell's heart, I stab at thee. Mrs. Timken loved what you did last night, but they think I did it. And they want me to keep coming up with brilliant windows. You gotta help me. Of course. We come in peace. And you go in pieces, asshole. Wide lanes. This is so luxurious. May I remind you that he and Dr. McCoy boarded Kronos One of their own free will? None of these facts are in dispute, Mr. President. Without our government, you'd be stuck in Siberia now, sucking the juice from a rotten commie potato. Three months before retirement. I'm too old for this Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Would you care to assist me in performing surgery on a torpedo? Damn it, man, I'm a doctor, not a torpedo technician. Mr. President! Ah! Danny Crane.